The last time I was allowed to play in Vegas with no bar is when I won. It was my happened to be my biggest single session win. I won eleven million five hundred twenty six thousand dollars in one session. What's up, everybody? Today's guest is Mickey Mays, professional poker player. Mickey has won millions of dollars playing the tables in Vegas. He came on to expose all of the ways that Vegas casinos cheat people out of money. He gave us an inside look at what it's like to be a high stakes poker player in Vegas partying with celebrities, gambling with their money. Nowadays, he actually helps people get clean from gambling addiction and uses his wealth and his reach to donate to a lot of different charities and funds around the world. He has the craziest stories, you guys. And of course, if you want to hear a bonus episode with him, go over to patreon.com slash The Connect Show. Without further ado, I give you Mickey Mays right here on The Connect. I just wanted to stop. I was like, what am I doing this? You know, I, I felt imprisoned when I was incarcerated. I felt imprisoned when I was homeless. I felt imprisoned when I was abusing substances. And now I'm imprisoned at my work. And I was like, I still haven't done life. That's when I see lights behind me start to flash. And I didn't even think, I just hit it. I was driving like my life depended on it. And then I parked the car, hopped out, closed the door, and I started running. And he pulls out a burner, shanks like six inches. And then he passes it to me. And he goes, here, that's yours. Don't ever leave the cell block without this. He was the reason I made it out of that place alive. Mickey Mace. Is that your real name? No. Okay. But yeah. Mickey is your a real first name. Uh, also, sort of no. So when I was born, my name was Mordechai. And my family said, we have to Americanize it. So they picked Michael. And the translation from Michael uh, back into Hebrew, because I'm Jewish, is Michael. So Mickey short for Michael. Uh. And when I was really young, like a teenager still in high school, my goal was to be an adult film star. And I wanted like the Dirt Diggler <laughs> name in lights, you know? And I, so I was thinking, well, what, what could my dirt diggler be? And I said, you know, Mickey's, you know, people call me Mickey kind of already. And I was like, okay, well, I got to come up with a last name type deal. And um, I just, just like, just like Marky Mark in, in the movie, I was like, like Mickey Mace, like dirt diggler, you know? And uh, at that age, I was also selling drugs and I was in the hood. So I was like, this is a great time to not use my full government name. So I just started implementing the full Mickey Mace as a teenager and it just stuck. And so now, you were manifesting a porn career yeah. from... A teenager. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you're from Jersey. I was born in New, Jer New Jersey. Okay. So yeah. you've got such a fascinating, wild story. And what's funny is you're kind of living that now a little bit. You're living sure. the life of a, an adult film star, but mm -hmm. you know, on steroids. What's up, everyone? I hope you're enjoying this episode. This is just a quick reminder that I'm going to be in Chicago on December 21st, headlining at Zany's Comedy Club. I love Chicago. It's the best city to do comedy in. And this is my final show of my fall tour. So come out and check me out. If you're in Chicago, go to johnnymitchell.biz for tickets. I will see you out there. This might be the last time I'm on the road for a very long time. So if you want to see me live, make sure to come on out. All right. johnnymitchell.biz for ticks. Let's get back into the episode. So you're everybody that wants to know, like, you know, the full autobiography can go watch you on No Jumper. You've told it on podcasts before. That. That's my most, <laughs> my number one interview I hate the most is No Jumper. Well, yeah. I hated my first two years of podcasting. So yeah. that for a very first interview, that was pretty good. Yeah, uh, it was viral. From, I guess. from Jersey, you're getting in trouble from a young age. Yeah. Doing drugs, yeah. selling drugs, yeah. stealing cars. Yep. Uh, who are you? I'm fascinated by stolen car rings. Were you contracted by, you know, somebody that could you know, sell them wholesale on the yeah, black yeah. market. Yeah. So we, there's actually, uh, we had two and sometimes kind of a third chop shop. Really the truth. Like, I don't really know. They chopped it. So I, I don't know exactly what mm. happened, but there was a flat rate, whether it had keys or didn't have keys and whether it was above or below a certain year. So there was just like a flat rate. So I already knew how much I was going to get for a car with no keys or with keys or what year it was. So you just bring it in 24 hours a day. They'll open up the thing. You just bring it, drop it, they hand you the cash and you're out. As many cars as you can give them. Yeah. They'll yeah, take. yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, I don't know if they put them in containers and shipped them out of here. I don't know if they chopped them down. I, they could have done a VIN swap. I never asked. I don't really care either. Who, who were these people that owned the chop shops? Italians? Two were Italian and one was black. Okay. There was three spots. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So how, and how did you learn how to steal cars? <laughs> Well, it's not hard. So I was a big like uh, home invasion guy as a kid. And so a lot of times what I do is I'd go into the home and on the way out, take car keys and just take the car. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. You're about my age, 80s, baby. A little Group bit younger. The 90s. Little okay. Younger, yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's already difficult to yeah. steal yeah. cars. I don't know how to era. hotwire, just to be super clear. Like I don't, I don't know how to hotwire a car. Okay. So a lot of times what I did was I got like these younger 
whoever was like a little bit younger than me that was trying to make some money, I would just tell them, I don't care how you get the car. This is the price I'll pay you to get a car. So you're subcontracting yeah, the workout. A hundred percent. Yeah. So, but you're from a family of means though. You're from Correct. like a smart Jewish family. Your dad was in real estate. Yep. Well, he ended up going to prison. Yep. Can you tell us about that? Sure. It was a, it was a Rico case, racketeering. Um, it was pr as white collar as it gets. I mean, it was really simple. It was like pretty standard, you know, I, I can't say like too many details that aren't already in on the internet that you can like look up mm. like it's not it, it wasn't like a crazy thing it was you know i mean you know he got himself in trouble in business uh, but was it uh was it intentional like was he a wise guy because i know a lot of those jewish guys on the east coast are affiliated sure. or work with the italian mafia was it something like that or was it just uh, like a, a case of him like defrauding real estate investors i would say it was more the former than the latter Okay, so it was something involving a larger mafia case. Of the sorts. And how long, how much time did he do? He was sentenced to, I think it's six, well, they do months in the feds. I think it was 60 months, which is five years. Five years, okay. Yeah. And he served it in a camp in West Virginia. So I used to go mm. visit him. He was in a camp. There was no, um, like, no fence. Like, it was like, you know, like, it was the kind of camp where, like, if you had a, an offense, let's say you were doing 30 years, and you never had, like, a single write-up while you were, in the prison itself mm. behind the wall for like your last five years, they just stick you in this camp. They'd right. be like for 25 years, you haven't even one time untied your shoelace. Just get out of here, go over there, buddy, and enjoy your last five years. And there's still people in that camp that will go crazy and run away. <laughs> like I, I saw when I was locked up, I saw dudes coming off of 20 year stretches that would go to those minimums. Mm. Yeah. And like, they'd find out their girl was like sleeping around after 20 years <laughs> yeah. and they would run, run off. And then they get yeah. themselves another five years, which is so stupid. So stupid. And they go behind the wall again anyway. Yeah. So, okay. Clearly that affected you clearly you know, you're acting out because, you know, this probably did something to you, you know, caused you to grow up fast, I would assume. At the time, I didn't think it had an effect on me. And I was a bad kid before he even like, before the first indictment came. At the time when I was young, I did not think it had an effect. When I got older, I just started to question. I go, did that have an effect? And <clears throat> as I started diving into that question internally, thinking like, how did it affect me? Did it affect me? To what extent was that my excuse or my reason to act out or that I felt that that was such a big deal and it was all over the media. I mean, he was in the newspaper every day on TV, on the, in the news. It was a big case. And um, I was like, oh, maybe I didn't feel like I was getting enough attention at home from my parents because mm -hmm. all the focus was on him right. and I felt alone, right? So was I acting out to get attention? <clears throat> and the deeper I got into this, I really just said, it actually doesn't matter. I did what I did mm -hmm. and he did what he did and it it came out, however it came out, it just did. And now all these years later, I just am where I am. So I don't actually know how much it affected me. I never. Has your dad gone back to prison since no. then or he's out? Bro, he couldn't be any more square. Right. He, I swear to God, he's so square that it's actually frustrating. Mm. It's actually frustrating. And he's in real estate? Yeah. What kind of real estate? Uh, So in New Jersey, they're called mostly garden apartments. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that term. I don't garden think style apartments? They're called garden apartments. It's like, uh, they're usually like two story buildings. There's a unit on the mm -hmm. first, unit on the second, and they're like studios, one bedroom and two bedroom. So they're really cheap. They're like starter apartments usually. Mm -hmm. Usually like a college kid would go there or a very young family, right? Because they're very affordable, but they're still very nice. So it'd be like the perfect entry mm -hmm. apartment. So we buy as many of those complexes as we can. Got it. So you have yeah. enterprising in your family. You're you're a yeah. money family. Yeah. Um, you're now a 12 year old kid. You're on drugs. Mm -hmm. You uh, end up homeless in New York City, mm -hmm. uptown Washington Heights. Right. It's grimy up there still. Yeah. And you're on the east side by the river, I believe, or the west side, whatever the grimy side of Washington Heights is. It was Highbridge Park. That's right. Yeah. That's right. A lot of homeless people around there, yeah. drug addicts. Yeah. You're a heroin addict at this point. Okay. Are you, <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> I tried I try to avoid like the substance abuse conversation. I think it's like the tackiest conversation. Everybody's got that story. Everybody partied. Everybody went from recreational and then beyond. Me, I, me never. No. I was never a heroin addict in Washington Heights. <laughs> this matters. This yeah. matters because this is the arc of the story. I would say that um my substance abuse surpassed recreational use. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh so you're, you know, at the lowest you can be. Sure. You end up getting out of that situation, end up in Florida. Right. 
uh, in a rehab center. No. I mean, I had, I have, I have been, but that's not at this point. Chronologically, that, that's not accurate. Um, at this point, uh, my friend, we call him Charlie Hustle. He had a house and he's like, let me stay in his house. He was, uh, he was also from New York. He was two years straight. And he's like, let me just try to save you. Right. And just let me stay with him. Yeah. Do you think he would have died? You think he would have OD'd or been killed if you had stayed on the streets? Maybe killed. I, I don't, I had OD'd so many times. It was like, but, but that's just part of the lifestyle. It's like very, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're a substance abuse abuser, that's very common. Mm. I'm not sure that that's what it would have taken me out. I think more likely if I wasn't killed that I would just gone to prison. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. I'm just in long stints in prison because you've been yeah. in and out of jail, right? Yeah, you yeah, had yeah. done like, like year long, like County stretches. Yeah. Yeah. No, I did. I did a few years. I did. Uh, I served three and a quarter years. Yeah. In and out though. Yeah. In and out. Yeah. Where, where, uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And are these city jails, County jails, or this is actually penitentiary time. I did one penitentiary and the rest were counties for drugs, all drugs and violence. Yeah. Right. Everything what kind of violence, like beating people up, getting in fights. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had a couple assault with deadly weapons. I had a few aggravated assault on police officers, a few simple assaults, you know. What's a simple assault? Like <laughs> just, a, assault? just assault? <laughs> just assault. Just yeah. simply assault. <laughs> just simply assault. No, the no extras. The, the aggravate is like the level up. Yeah. Okay. So sometimes I had like the level down, like, you know, it's like, a, like I don't fight. It was like a mutual fist fight. You know, we get right, arrested, something right. like that. Okay. Know? So you were just a hooligan. Yeah. 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 Taking I pinches. A, yeah. I was just a bad kid yeah. hitting, hitting licks and mm -hmm. getting in fights. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, you end up in Florida, mm -hmm. which is where everybody coming off of drugs or going to get on drugs mm -hmm. goes, <laughs> right? Right. Um, you, I, it was a tattoo shop. That yeah. You were so Charlie at. Hustle, sorry. when he picked me up from the airport, it was a PBI I landed at. He drove me straight to, it's called All City Tattoo. It's on Federal Highway, Highway in Boca Raton. And he walked me in. It was uh, Michelle and Chris Smades. Like to this day, I'm in touch with these people. They all saved my life, all of them collectively. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know me at the time. Charlie walks me in and he goes, uh, Mickey, you're going to mop their floors and scrub their toilets and they're not going to pay you, but I'm going to let you live in my house. Mm. And I was like, say less, you know, mm -hmm. and, that, and that's what I did. And you did that uh, for some time until mm -hmm. you got an opportunity. Probably about six months, probably. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And then that's when you got an opportunity to start working for these guys that owned rehab clinics. Well, first I worked for a guy named Sean Dalton. Uh, Sean Dalton owned the home that Charlie was renting that we lived in. Mm. And Sean, who is our age also, he came in just to like do like maintenance on the house, right? He owned the property. And when he left, he, the short of it is he asked Charlie if I wanted to work, right? Like, do I, do I want to spend a day working? It'll pay me a hundred bucks. And I'm like, I'll do anything for a hundred bucks. You know, I needed money. I didn't have money. I was like eating leftovers and mm. ramen and whatever. And he want this. So about six months have passed. Now it's summertime. We're in Florida. And he goes, I want you to paint this house. If you paint the house, I'll give you a hundred bucks. I go, sure. Got it done like four hours. And he goes, you want to paint another house tomorrow? I'll give you another hundred bucks. I go, of course. So then I quit the tattoo shop and just basically did that full time. He ended up, Sean ended up taking a contract with a sober living company. And we were rehabbing the houses, like doing some internal, uh, internal uh, interior demo and then rebuilding, you know, like, so I learned everything. I had to cut tile, hang sheetrock, uh, framing, uh, some minor plumbing, like how to install mm. a toilet or a sink and stuff like this. So these were uh, not halfway houses, but like, like ha yeah, like halfway houses. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Halfway houses, so yeah. people coming not in treatment, but on like, the way out. On the but, way out. Yeah, I it was, see. It was like the you know halfway house, three quarter way house. You know, right. like on, on the way back into integrating with society. Makes sense. Yeah. So we we took the contract to to rehab all their houses. Mm -hmm. They're so the their halfway houses. Right. And when we finished the last one, then a guy named Jeff Thomas came to me. And Jeff and I had known each other from like just the community of the straight edge community, the sober community, whatever. And uh, he goes, we know you're trying to straighten your life out and stay on the right path, but you're out of work. Do you want to work with us mm -hmm. in the, in the facility itself? And, you know, you know, like I said it before in the past, um, I didn't know what I was doing. And I told him that I was like, I don't, I don't know anything. I'm like a dumb kid. I never graduated high school. I don't know anything. I'm a felon. Like I don't, I'm doing, I'm a day laborer. Like, I don't even know what you want from me. And he goes, you'll figure it out. Just just work, work as hard as you've been. And I did figure it out really fast. And, yeah. and Jeff and his partners and the other guys, we all started learning from each other. I probably, I don't know. I didn't have anything to offer them really. So mostly I did the learning. And I just kind of sat quiet, absorbed what I could, studied, watched. And for me, I didn't have anything else in life but just to go to work. Right? And you started climbing. Really fast. More, even bigger yeah. salary, bigger yeah. salary, bigger salary. Really fast. You yeah. did what like, yeah, it's, it's what you're supposed to do when you want to, take over a company is learn 
everything yeah. about that industry or that company. Right. Uh, you're working like a madman. Mm -hmm. You're working like making up for lost time. You're working like everybody I met who got out of prison. Like yeah. you had that junkie hustle. Yeah. You know, I say that with all due respect. No, I you know, had I'm with that you. drive. Yeah. yeah. Um, we had nothing else, bro. Yeah. Yeah, but then, but look at then now you're making half a million bucks a year, right. I think, is a, a salary. That was like my peak of salaries. Yeah. Hey guys, this episode is sponsored by ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is a virtual private network. Use ExpressVPN to unlock movies and shows that are only available in other countries. This whole week, you could have been binging Fargo on Canadian Netflix using ExpressVPN. It's so simple to do. Just fire up the ExpressVPN app, change your location to Canada refresh, and that's it. This is an amazing tool to keep your location anonymous. ExpressVPN lets you control where you want sites to think you're located, okay? You can choose from over 100 different countries. So for me, I love watching television shows like gangster shows from Britain and Europe. And with ExpressVPN, I can do just that. I can access content from all of these different Netflix and Hulu sites, right? There are tons of choices when it comes to VPNs out there, but the reason I love ExpressVPN is in the name, Express. It's so fast, I never have to deal with lag or buffering, and it makes streaming absolutely seamless. ExpressVPN works with any streaming service too, Hulu, BBC, iPlayer, you name it. ExpressVPN also works on all your devices, phones, smart TVs, and more. That's amazing. You could be on a train in Madrid watching a Hulu show from Australia. Bonkers. So if you want to get access to hundreds of new shows, use my link right now. That's expressvpn.com slash connect pod and get an extra three months of ExpressVPN absolutely free. Once again, that is express, E-X-P-R-E-S-S, vpn.com slash connect pod. And you'll get three months free. Check them out, you guys. How did you flip that into then owning your own rehab centers? So a company, uh, a guy that I knew, we had been coworkers on one of my, like on the come up, right? At mm -hmm. one of the other facilities. He, I don't know how exactly he did, but he ended up becoming an equity partner in a treatment center, right? Mm -hmm. They were failing. It was two guys that owned it my buddy and then a guy that I didn't know, right? And they were failing. So I guess they internally, they had a conversation. What can we do to save this thing? You know, we need help, right? We mm -hmm. need someone who knows what they're doing and will work for cheap or whatever the conversation was because they didn't have a cash flow. So somehow they decided to contact me. So the guy, the, my buddy's name was Kevin. Kevin calls me and he goes, hey, can I bring you in for a meeting? I have something really cool. I'm like, sure. I go to the meeting. I walk to the facility. I sit down with him and the other owner. They're giving me their pitch, you know, what they do, you know, blah, blah, all the usual business, you know, business meeting stuff mm -hmm. regular. And I go, okay, well, what do you guys want from me? They go, well, we need help. We need help with infrastructure. We need help um, with uh, uh, expansion. We need help with everything, right? And I go, okay, how much money do you have? What's your, what's your marketing budget, you know? And they go, well, we're cash poor. So I say, okay, what do you got for me then? Uh, what do you... I can't work for free, you know? Like, what if we give you equity? That's right. That's right. And I saw this coming and I, I pressured it a bit and they offered me sweat equity. They offered mm -hmm. me equity for, mm -hmm. for my work. And that was the first one I owned. And the truth is it still didn't succeed, right? But mm -hmm. it, it didn't fail at my at my doing. Right. It was basically unsalvageable. Uh -huh. But what did happen was I'm now on papers owning a uh, a mental health facility, right? I'm, I'm now an owner of a healthcare provider. Mm. So now when I'm taking meetings, I'm not going as a, hey guys, I work for a rehab or I work like, I'm not an employee. I was like, I own this thing, yeah. you know? So now I'm meeting the guys that are killing it in the game. Right. And I knew what I was doing despite the, the failure of that actual first company. And so when they sat down with me, they took the meeting because I own a healthcare provider. When they talk to me, even though I look like this, they go, this guy's on it. He mm -hmm. understands. Yeah. He goes. He sees our problem. He says he has uh, 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 the ability to resolve it. He can relate to our clients clearly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they would give me a shot, and then you know. So you okay. Know, so they would put up the money. You had yeah. the expertise and the hustle and the sweat equity. Yeah. It was almost and always they sweat banked equity. You. It was almost always sweat equity. Almost always. Some occasionally I put money in. Occasionally mm -hmm. I opened my own thing or paid for my own thing. Mm -hmm. But at some point the 
like the ROIs are so high. The money coming in was so great that the money going out, I was like, I can spend that at a dinner and not mm -hmm. even realize, right. you know, so tell us what kind of money there is. I mean, I imagine Florida, I mean, that's just, that is the gold mine for any kind of like predatory or not any kind of rehab center unregulated pharmacies, sure. you know, well, prescription drugs. I mean, that's, it's the Mecca of it. There was How a much time, money is there in rehab centers? Well, endless, endless, but not anymore. There was a time where it was, there was so much common practice that is now against the rules, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it wasn't harmful, what had happened was there were a lot of bad players. There absolutely were a lot of bad players, right? Who would cut corners and abuse the system and hurt people. And mm. they wanted people to stay on drugs so and keep billing insurance and like really bad things. <laughs> of course. And yeah. kids were dying. And the thing is like, you didn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. You, there was no, you, you could have been a good guy saving lives. But I was a charity case, right? I only mm -hmm. got like my life together because people gave me help, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, it was really easy, this concept of like, yeah, my life got saved because people helped me. I'm just going to help others yeah. and their lives will be saved. And then it'll like right. this, right? What kind of fraud, can you give us an example of like what a fraudulent case looks like yeah. in one of those rehab centers? Sure. So, and, and there's so many, um, like uh, there's a story about a guy named Kenny Chapman. He's doing 27 and a half years in the feds, right? They actually did, they did an episode of American Greed on him. Uh, so Kenny although he was found guilty of a lot of things, not just civil, but some serious criminal as well. But some of the things he did just on the civil side, like the fraud side, right, mm -hmm. was overbilling. So if a patient, let's say, was there and they were taking a urine, like a drug test, mm -hmm. three times a week or whatever it was, he would bill for the maximum amount of testing they're doing, lab work, right? Even if it wasn't a necessity and even if a doctor didn't sign a DO on it, a doctor's order. Mm -hmm. So the insurance company, eventually they took a look. They go, you're telling, this is what the insurance company says. They go, Kenny, you're telling me that this kid who was clean on Monday and clean on Tuesday had to get tested and billed again Wednesday, Thursday, mm -hmm. and Friday? They go, if he was clean Monday and Tuesday, wouldn't he also be clean on Wednesday? Couldn't you wait till next Monday right. and be like rational? Mm -hmm. But he's getting, you know, a thousand bucks a cup <laughs> per person, <laughs> right. you know. Right. So it's obvious so, that it was, so it was it's, a case it, agreed. Right. So it's essentially insurance that the money is coming in from insurance. Correct. The, the yeah. majority of it, it seems yeah. like. Yeah, I've well, also heard I've also heard of guys uh that will are in on it. Like say you own a rehab center, I being your friend will turn myself in or say, Hey, I need to tell my insurance I gotta go detox at your insurance center. I might, you might bang out the insurance company for 30 grand and we'll split it off. or something. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's patient brokering, right? Yeah. And what happened with patient brokering, which is so unfortunate, it's not inherently and always exclusively an evil thing, but because so many kids that were either still actively in the lifestyle of using drugs and, and conning and stuff like this, or just, just got out of it, mm. their mental state was still in that wow, look at all this money and mm -hmm. da, 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 da. I'm sober now. I'm like out of prison now. Like, well, I want money, right? So what happened was they would start paying kids. But the thing is you get the biggest bang for your buck when the kid comes in pissing hot. So they'd be like, here's some money up front. Go, go, go hit cops, the streets. hit the yeah. streets, cop something. I'll pay for your hotel for the night if you need. Yeah. In the morning, I'm gonna send you a driver. We're gonna pick you up and bring you in. Right. But kids are dying. Yeah. And you didn't have to do that. There's right. a, there's such an epidemic of drug abuse in the country that you don't have to do yeah, there's that. There's plenty of drug addicts. Yeah. They're, like they're, le legitimate yeah. people on drugs, legitimately trying to save their lives and get off drugs. All you have to do is help people. Right. That's it. If you just help people, you still right. make the money. You so know? Like, essentially they were drug dealers who also who were getting a double pop. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's why the, wow. the, the, the pay per head and the, and the patient brokering and the, and the paying whatever became such a, a regulate a, a regulated nightmare, right? So the feds cracked down. Huge. So huge, it's harder huge. to open up. There, there's a not a now. I'll tell you this, there's not a single person roaming the streets that was engaged in that that did not get indicted. There's not a single person. Wow. Uh, when I tell you they did hauls. Did you ever get hauled no in? No way. I never did that stuff. Okay. So no, I, I, I just was, thought you might have got caught in like no, a dragnet of something. I was so far from that, buddy. Oh my God. I was so squeaky clean yeah. that you could have looked, you gave me a cavity search if you wanted. Right. Oh, I had no concern. No, no, no. Okay. So no, let's no, talk no. about that. So you're, uh, before all this regulation, you're mm -hmm. still running a clean operation. Are you majority owner? I think you said you owned at a certain point, you owned or operated like 300 pharmacies. 
Yeah, but it's- H- it, How many rehab centers? And what's the difference between the pharmacies and the rehab centers? Well- And did you find that a contradiction that you're no, now be, like the, a pharmaceutical the, drug dealer, but the, also running rehab No, no, no. Because I, I wasn't selling pharmaceutical medication. As a matter of fact, I wasn't selling medication at all. So Is what's it, the pharmacy about? So when a, when a hospital or a hospice center or a nursing home needs a walking cane or a hospital bed, Who's paying for the hospital bed? The insurance company is, yeah. but they're only improving it for someone who legitimately needs to be in a bed or mm-hmm. in a walker. Well, where are they getting it from? Pharmacies, specific types. Uh, I see. So you yeah. supplied you you supplied medical devices sure. or uh, for disabled people. Sure. That's all. You didn't. Yeah. You didn't sell. You weren't selling pills. Never pills. Wasn't a pill mill. Never sold a single so, pill. So or, yeah. So you're in your twenties while you're doing this. Sure. Yeah. How much money were you making? I mean, are you now on? Are you rich? I was pretty on. I, well, it's all relative. I'll tell you, like now, even whatever amount of money I've amassed, mm-hmm. some of the people I'm around are like, forget about you, kid. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, I'm like, yeah. God, you don't know what my right. bank account says. But so it's all relative. So are you, uh, you have other investors staking you? as you're expanding these pharmacies and, and well, rehab centers? Well, it was centers? pretty easy. Like you can start a pharmacy so you just hire a consultant, really, because they do everything for you, right? Mm. They just hand you the paperwork. The I's already dotted, T's mm-hmm. are crossed. They just go sign here, put put your EIN here, put your NP. Mm-hmm. You know, you're just really, you're applying for MPIs. The, the, like, we'll put it here. It's right. very simple, right? And um, you can get it for anywhere from 7,500 bucks to 15K. And then on top of that, depending on what kind of pharmacy you have, and there's many types of pharmacies. And there's only a couple. What you're considering with the medication, it's mm-hmm. called a retail pharmacy. Retail pharmacies are inevitably never going to be profitable based on the selling of pills mm-hmm. to a month or a pharmacy like CVS or Rite Aid or even a mom and pop, a successful month in the specifically in the medication department is them breaking even. They make all their money on the rebates from the manufacturers. Wow. That's where the money's being made. Interesting. Yeah. So those pharmacies, you need a, m- a very large uh, customer base, mm-hmm. right? Because it's all about quantity and with the quantity comes with the rebates. Mm-hmm. So uh, different types of pharmacies like dropship pharmacies you only have to have a hundred square foot office, right? So you can lease an office anywhere you want. It'd be super cheap, cost you 500 bucks a month. First, last security call, 1500. Plus uh, your staff member, imagine you're paying 500. So there's another 2K, right? 500 a week, paying yeah. 2K to sit in the office answering phones. Yeah. But you're a dropship pharmacy. So nobody's coming in. Right. And nothing is like leaving from there. So you're really just, br- uh, um, you're like the middleman between the manufacturer and the patient. Right. That's who I get my, I get my pills sent every month yeah, yeah, from exactly, the pharmacy. Right. Yeah, exactly yeah, right. Just from the drop shipper. Exactly yeah. right. Just wow, same concept. I might concept. go into business, dude. Same concept. So you got a great business mind. Sure. You just and and your expertise was just in numbers. Yeah. Math. Uh you were a good marketer too, though. You know, you yeah. know how to market yourself. I, I figured out advertising pretty pretty early on. Advertising because everything was some version of mm. um like uh how you say like high social acuity, right? Mm-hmm. So it's just like this sort of... <sighs> but I'm trying to figure out your mind. I- I'm trying to y- y- figure out how you took this step to becoming this wildly successful professional gambler. Like clearly there was there the, the skill set, uh, your mind is is works in a different way. And it's definitely math oriented. It's numbers oriented. You're a numbers guy. Um, Yeah. I don't really know that much, right? Like, I'm not a smart guy. Like, I don't like, I'm not, whatever. No. You know, <laughs> obviously, you know, it's not like it's written on my face. <laughs> but, you know, but, you know, you're a Jewish kid. You're a bean counter. You guys, you just, yeah. you know how to take $1 and turn it into two. Yeah. I love this. Yeah. I wish I had this mind. Yeah. I, you know, and I, I want to use it as kind of motivation for people that like think they need a bunch of money to start a business. No, I started, I was homeless. Dude, yeah. tell us about real quick before we yeah. get into the transition to gambling. Sure. You and your uh, couple of friends or a couple of business partners would sit in like a boiler room. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is, my, this is one of my favorite parts of my like life story. Like this is one of my best moments. So, uh, so okay. So we had many offices, right? But each office served a purpose. Like there was a business being ran out of there. Yeah. Like, a specific thing. Well, we needed a place where we can sit. It was me and two guys, right? Uh, unfortunately, uh, one of them was murdered. So rest in peace, uh, Sam Rizzo. But- um, and then there's, uh, uh, Rusty who, who is still with us. Thank God, you know, and, uh, the three of us were best friends. We did everything together. We went on vacations together. We, you know, worked together. We hung out everything. And so we were like, we need to be together more, right? If we're partners, we need to do this, even though our businesses are scattered everywhere. So we, um, 
we rented an office in a high rise uh, in uh, Boca Raton, also on Federal Highway. And the way it went, when you walked in would be kind of like the Sally Port. It was like, I guess it's supposed to be like the receptionist area, mm-hmm. right? It was like you walk in the, mm-hmm. the main door of the office and it was like this room about the size of this, uh, actually probably about the size of this studio here, right? Mm-hmm. And then we had doors on all the walls that went into the rest of the offices. Mm-hmm. Those were supposed to, probably supposed to be like the owner's offices. But what we did instead was, because nobody was really coming in and out of this office for meetings to meet with us, right? Mm-hmm. This was like our headquarters, mm-hmm. our nucleus. So we, me, Rizzo, and Rusty put our desks in here so we'd be on top of each other. So if any of us are working on something, as we're taking phone calls, even though it's like a private call, one of us would over here and be like, I got a guy for that. I heard something about that. Oh, you, you're thinking about that? I heard about that last week and I heard so-and-so's crushing it. We yeah. should look into that. Yeah. So it was like that. And what we do is every time we have one of these ideas, we just retrofit one of these side offices to run a beta test on whatever that new idea was. Wow. And if it worked, we would sell it or just expand it into one of our other offices. Wow. So it's just, you're constantly looking at the best businesses to make money out of. Yeah, it was, that was our only current path. We didn't have other goals or ambitions. What were some of your... What were some of your most successful ventures aside from the medical stuff? A lot of it was in the healthcare because I started by by working in healthcare. That's like I went from homeless to day laborer yeah. to healthcare, yeah. right? So that was our backbone. And we understood that all the failures we were going to inevitably have, and we had so many, mm. were always going to be funded by our, our bread and butter, which was the healthcare. Your core business. Our core business. So what were some ancillary businesses that you remember, just a few of them that that did well? That did well? We sold software for a while. That was cool. We sold software. None of us are software people. I couldn't even turn a computer on if you wanted me to. Yeah, you I, just I, found out what podcasts were. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. You know, seriously, you know. So, but I, but we knew how to sell things. We knew somebody that was um, that was manufacturing them. We found leads for them. I also, f- oh, I just realized. Okay, okay. So we found we found leads for them, and we found an outlet. It just made sense. We just connected the dots. Yeah. And we just took a vig on it. That's it. A little markup. Yeah. It was easy. Yeah. You can plug and play any widget, anything. All you have to do is to have a customer base, a yeah. manufacturer and a customer base. And how would you find that customer base? So this is so interesting. I, I, I don't know how I overlooked this. Actually, the most profitable bit business I had that was an ancillary was lead gen. The lead gen was a pure accident. This is what happened. I had a friend who um, had very large sales offices all over the world, right? And he was like a really close friend. You know, we used to like double day, we'd go on trips, whatever. And we're talking one day and he goes, yeah, I'm going to shut down one of my big offices. I go, what happened? And he goes, well, blah, 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 not relevant. What was relevant, he said, Are, we just bought all these leads, man. I go, oh, what kind of leads? Just having fr- my friend, just conversation. And he goes, we just bought the National Consumer Database. And I go, wow. I go, are they vetted? Are they qualified? Are they targeted? And he goes, no. I just have every single American's phone number, name, and address. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And I go, I go, what are you going to do with it? And he goes, you got any ideas? And I go, let me think about it. So this is what I did. I, I went to a lot of the, all everybody that we knew, because our whole life was only about work, right? We didn't have like non-work related friends. Mm-hmm. We just called all our friends and I go, what's your hot product right now? What are you selling? And I remember one guy said to me, um, I'm selling... Um, what do he say? I forget what he said. I forget. It doesn't even matter, right? He said a particular product. He goes, that's hot for me right now. I'm on it, right? I go, great. Uh, can I give you some free leads and you tell me how they are? And he goes, yeah, of course I'll take free leads. Because in sales, leads is everything, right? And these guys are just literally dialing, dialing for dollars, like, yeah. like direct sales. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So he goes, yeah, I'll take free leads and I'll tell you how they go. Or I'll just give them to some guys and we'll figure it out. I said, great. What I'm going to do is though, I'm not going to hand you the leads. I'm just going to r- route my uh, dialing system to your call center. And he goes, okay. So he's like, I, I tell him there's like an IP, there's like an, there's a way to connect how many computers you want, whatever. Mm-hmm. There's like a system to it. Whatever. I said, tell me how many computers you want and I'm going to route their dialers. When they route the dialers, I controlled when they get to c- click the disposition of the call. So what I did on my dialer that they were now accessing is I put all these irrelevant questions. All right. Do you have sore feet? Do you have a sore back? Do you have hair loss? Do you have erectile dysfunction? And the the guy was, I forget what he was selling, like car insurance or something, Mm. right? So if you're the consumer and the salesman that he works for my buddy is good, right? And you're the consumer and you're on the phone with a salesman and he's good. He goes, hey man, I'm selling car insurance. Uh, I see you're between the age of 35 and 40 and blah, 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 and all this. And he goes, yeah, I'm interested in car insurance. 
Now, the salesman can't go to the next page until he clicks the following answers. Do you have erectile dysfunction? Do you have foot pain? Do you have gangrene? Do you have hair loss? Whatever. The consumer doesn't know what's happening. They're like, this is a stupid question, yeah. but car insurance, poly right. bureaucracy, whatever. Yeah. What they're really doing is I had that salesman qualifying my leads. Oh. So then I would call a guy that I know who sells erectile dysfunction oh medication. And I'd Brilliant. say, hey, I have specifically targeted erectile dysfunction patients. Do you want these leads? And those are more valuable. Yeah, because they're, they're so targeted. Hot they're hot leads. Yeah. 10 minutes ago, a guy hung up and said, I got ED. And I go, hey, guy who sells ED, my friend, <laughs> here you go. Call this guy. He's going to buy him right now. Wow. But then I would do it to that salesman also. Mm -hmm. And I was constantly vetting and vetting and vetting and requalifying all mm -hmm. my own data. Mm -hmm. And I didn't pay for the data to begin with. I just got my buddy who already bought them. Yeah. I said, listen, I'm not going to pay for them, but I'll get you some money back on it. I'll mm -hmm. give you a piece of whatever I get. And he goes, better than nothing. We all, all ended up making a lot of money, but. All we were doing, we kept requalifying the same piece of consumer data. Wow. So if you told me on the first initial call for car insurance that you had hair loss, ED, toe fungus, and uh, ingrown fingernail, yeah. your same piece of consumer data is going to four of my other friends to sell you to on those sell specific you, things. Wow. And then when you speak to those guys, they're going to ask you other questions right. that I've created on their dial. It's my dialer that they're right. using. And now we're asking you even more. Yeah. Do you then, have back pain? Do you yeah, have any pets? Yeah. You got pets. Are yeah. you allergic to cats? Are the, do you, do you, are you moving houses? Yeah. I got guys that do logistics. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll give you right. Boom. I'll give the logistics lead. Right How do you, you scale this? This seems like a massive uh, so, time taker. Well, yeah. Well, well, all I had was time. All you were doing was working. That's it. Yeah. How many people would you talk to a day or how many calls would your sales guys oh, make hundreds a day? of thousands. Wow. But we had call centers all over the no, world. No, not though. a day. Yeah. Yeah. All, yeah. But we had call centers all over the world. Right. It's easy. So there's call centers in all these other countries yeah. where the dollar goes so far. Right. And all they have to do the is just sit The Philippines. That's uh, it. That's the big one right yeah. now. Wow. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. So you so did well. Easy. Yeah, you did great. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So you got, you're just a money guy. It's coming in from every angle. You're staying sober. It wasn't about the money either. I had way more than I ever had or needed for, I lived a pretty simple life, mm -hmm. you know? It was just what we did. We didn't know anything else. It was, don't do drugs, go to work. Mm. That's all we knew. So how then did this transition into who you are now and what you were to become? So I grew up in like New York City card rooms. I grew up around that right. stuff, uh, the Italian families right. and the rich Jewish kids. Yeah. So gambling was in my blood, it was in my family, it was mm. in my neighborhoods. It was just regular. And um, then my life took all the dark turns and yeah. gambling was no longer an option for leisure. I had no leisure, yeah. right? And so now I'm making money again and there's casinos local to where I was living. So a where are you living? At? Oh, down in Florida. Yeah, in Florida. Yeah, yeah. So there was the Hard Rock. There was Coconut Creek, which is actually like my go-to. Like there's a group of us. We all work together. We all were together every day. And a group of us would be like, let's go get dinner at NYY, right? Which is the, the steakhouse, mm -hmm. you know? Let's do it. We're there, we're eating, and we'd all look at each other and go, you guys want to hit the tables? <laughs> go, yeah, let's go. You know? <laughs> and so we were gambling almost every day, right? When we were getting, getting, but the thing is, none of us were like really winning. Like none of us did it to win. We were just degenerates. We were kids with too much money and we're just having a good time. Anyway, so the businesses, all the businesses are growing, the money's coming in, great time for everybody, blah, blah, blah. This is all like new to all of us because we're all like young guys and we didn't know that this was coming in our future and having a good time. Um, I ended up getting out of the business. So uh, a byproduct, which was unfortunate of me, Rizzo and Rusty being so 24 hours a day, seven days a week for so many years intertwined is that eventually we used to like rub each other the wrong way, which is going to happen always. Mm -hmm. And we'd find a way to work through it. At some point, we, the three of us stopped being able to work through it. It was just, there was never a moment we weren't on top of each other. And if we had a disagreement in one category of our life, slowly it started to infiltrate and trickle into all the areas of our life and just became problematic. So I bought them two out. Mm. When I bought them out, uh, shortly after Rizzo was murdered and Rusty had sort of gone off the grid and he went to live a quiet life, right? I was giving him his checks every month and, and that was that. And um, when they were no longer in my business picture, I didn't have to take their thoughts, feelings, or opinions into account. And it, I don't know what it was, but it turns out I was right that my ideas the whole time were better than their ideas. Mm. Right? And I can only say that because the evidence says that. When they no, long, no longer were decision makers and I was the sole decision maker, 
the companies exploded well beyond like what I anticipated them to do, especially in the short time period mm -hmm. it was, you know, and short amount of time goes by. I'm doing all of the work, which was a lot, but I'm making all of the money, which was also a lot. I just wanted to stop. I was like, what am I doing this? You know, I, I felt imprisoned when I was incarcerated. I felt imprisoned when I was homeless. I felt imprisoned when I was abusing substances and now I'm imprisoned at my work. Mm. I'm like, I'm getting older. I'm in like my mid to late twenties ish, like mid, you know, whatever. And I was like, I still haven't done life. Yeah. You know, you haven't become an adult film star yet. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> or any of the other Is that percolating things. in your mind still? Like, do you still want to No, be on camera? Well, because I do so much anyway, I, 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 a lot of the girls around me are adult stars. So a lot of them, we, you know, when we are together they, for themselves, like, Hey, can we just record this? I want to look right. back on it. Are you, you know? still at, at this time when you're in Florida and you're uh -huh. making money or did you start to hang out with porn stars? Like, is that, no, uh, you haven't got into I, that quite no, yet. Not quite yet. I was, I had quite my possibly above average mm -hmm. share of you know, yeah. sexual partners, right. but, uh, no, there was like occasional, occasionally I'd have like a porn star and I was like, Whoa, this is cool. Like, mm. you know, like mark it off the bucket list, but nah, not really. Not okay. today. It's just my, so my social circle is made up right. of a lot of female. Well, porn cause stars. it's you, you live now the version of like a Hollywood, you, you, you're Hollywood, but in the gambling space. And I feel like when you're a professional gambler in Vegas, porn stars are just there. Like that's part of the deal. You yep. know, it's like peanut butter and jelly. Yep. So, but okay. So how, tell us about the gambling. Yeah. So, uh, I sold the companies. Yeah. I either sold, stopped operating or gave away, uh, which are really challenging concepts to understand to someone who's ever been in that position. Take my word for it. Right. It, it, at the time it just made the most sense mm -hmm. and I just stopped. And so now I have this money and, uh, my girl was living with me. We split up, right? I moved her out, got her a crib and a car, whatever. She's on her own. I'm now living alone. Uh, my two best friends and business partners are no longer in the picture because I bought them out, right? I'm no longer working, so I'm not busy. And I'm just like sitting. I lived on the beach in, you know, in the Miami area. And I'm just like sitting every day. And I'm like, I got to do something different. And I go, well, I've never been to LA. And I had an idea for a really incredible business venture in LA County had the perfect demographic of people I needed to beta test this concept. And it was so phenomenal. And, uh, regardless whether that, that idea happened, came to my head or not, LA just seemed like the move. I was like, I'm young, I'm rich, I'm single. Let me go like be like a retired bachelor mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. and just party and check it out. So I come out to LA and one of the most important, um, employees I had, for my businesses was based here in LA and he's a degenerate gambler. And again, I've always been a degenerate gambler. So him being my basic, basically my only friend in LA when I first arrived, we didn't know what else to do with ourselves, but go gamble. Then COVID comes. And when COVID comes, LA shut down. You know, LA was one of the cities that they tried to arrest you if you weren't an essential worker and you're mm -hmm. in the street. Vegas was the opposite. Vegas stayed open to <laughs> the bitter end. That's right. They're like, screw you. Yeah. We're not closing until you close us, you know? So when LA starts shutting down, Vegas stays open. So it was really easy for me and my boy to just spend all our time mm -hmm. in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, we were just gambling regular. You know, what do you put, what are you playing at the beginning? What's your game? Black, Blackjack and Baccarat. Okay. Yeah. And we play everything, but those are the games we mm -hmm. liked. And you know, I was buying in between, you know, every, I would say weekly, maybe 30 to 50 K and we were winning like 30 to 50 K roughly, you know, and we did that for like a little while per then week. I, yeah. Every week. Yeah. Okay. So you're and, about breaking even. No, we were winning 30 to 50. We were profitable like wow. almost week after week. We had some losses, but I never went there thinking I was going to win. We just went there to blow off steam and party because LA shut down. Mm -hmm. So we just happened to be winning. So for us, the con we were just thinking like, we're having a great time partying. We're meeting tons of women, meeting more guys, you know, guys also like friends. Right. And we're making some money. Like this is a sweet gig. So a little bit of time passes. Most weeks were a winner, but probably a decent bit was luck and we just didn't care. We weren't to, to make 50 grand a week profit yeah. in Vegas. What do you need to be putting down? Well, we were putting down. So we'd put down between 30 and 50 and our profit was about 30. 50. Roughly. We doubled up. So you doubled up. Yeah. Roughly. We doubled so up. now are you getting love from the casinos at this point? Tons of love guys. I need to take a minute to tell you about factor meals. Don't spend all of your time at the grocery store paying inflationary prices for your groceries. 
Just get Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service. They'll get you eating well for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian approved meals that show up right at your doorstep. Meal prep takes two minutes. Just pop a meal in the microwave or on the skillet, heat it up, and you're ready to go. With the holidays here, I'm completely overwhelmed with travel, gift shopping, and dealing with the family. Factor has helped relieve almost all of the stress by providing incredible easy meals for me to eat. Like for example, last night I had the roasted garlic chicken with a sour cream and onion mashed potato. It was delicious. It's quick, it's delicious, and it allows me to focus on everything that I have going on, which is a ton. Podcasting, stand up, the girlfriend, the family. I hate going to the grocery store. It's better to order your meals on Factor. And they have as many options as the grocery store. Okay. Choose from over 35 meals every week. This definitely beats those three day old leftovers you have in your fridge. Head to factormeals.com slash connect 50 and use code connect 50. That's connect five zero to get 50% off. Once again, that's connect five zero at factormeals.com slash connect five zero to get 50% off. This is unbeatable. You guys, I cannot recommend factor meals enough. Happy holidays. Let's get back to it. If you're spending 50 grand a week in Vegas, yeah. uh, how between how many casinos is that? What was your preferred casino at the time? And what do they start to do for you in terms of like flying you out on private jets? Yeah. Does that all come in at this point? Halfway. Okay. I'm not going to say what my preferred casino is because I don't want to promote them. I don't think anybody should gamble. I discourage gambling. Okay. Right? So I don't want anyone to think it's promotion. But usually we we usually play like on a weekly basis to sometimes a third casino. Like if we're getting crushed at two of them. Yeah. If we're getting crushed at one, we'd go to a second one. If we're getting crushed there, which wasn't that often, then we'd go to like a third, a third mm-hmm. company, mm-hmm. you know? Um, they would give me a lot of things, but I also didn't know what I was allowed. Like I didn't know what was I was eligible to get. So I didn't know what to ask for it. You know, I was just getting what they were giving, but they were only giving a little bit more than the other company gave to get my business. You okay, know? so who, who, what are they giving you at this point? Just sweets? They're like limos, right? So unlimited li- limousine rides. <laughs> uh, they would reimburse me for flights. So I'd fly like JSX or like, you know, first class or yeah. whatever. And they just like give me the cash when I arrived. They gave me free entry and auto qualified me to every quarterfinals of every tournament on the strip. You know, so you could win, you know, oh. one, two. Mm, I don't think there was many that were bigger than $2 million wins. I think the tournaments were roughly like a million bucks and two million bucks to the winner. And I was getting not just free entry, but I was auto qualifying into the quarter round. So I only had to win two rounds and I got one or two million dollars. Wow. They did pay in promo chips, but nonetheless, it's convertible. It, right. You make money. And so you were playing tournaments at this point too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you're yeah. starting to get good. Yeah. What yeah, were yeah. some of your first tournaments? What were some of those big wins in those tournaments at the beginning? Um, yeah, like a, mil- a million and two million, but it's promo chips. So you can't just take the chips, go to the cage and say, give me a million dollars. You have to play those chips. And there's two types of promo chips. There's one that when you place the bet, they are taking that chip away from you. And if you lose, you get nothing. But if you win, you get back the equivalent of that chip in convertible chips. I see. I see. So you have to win them. You, you have, have to, to win. win. You have to win no matter no matter what promo chip you get. You have to win to make it convertible to cash. So if you if they give you if you win two million dollars with the promo chips, uh, you'll you get could, realistically you could, you'll get a quarter million in cash. That's what it'll probably be. Okay. Yeah. Not bad though. Yeah. And yeah. Then, not bad. And how fast and could you convert that? How fast, fast could you convert that? Fast. So there used to be a, a trick we used to be able to do. You can't do it anymore. But we used to be able to do this. When you get paid promo chips, you go to a baccarat table. You bet max bet on bank and the equal max bet on player. You're always going to lose one, but you're always going to win the other unless it's a tie. So if you got $2 million in promo chips, you're walking away with a million dollars in cash minus commissions and minus ties. But they stopped letting us do that. Is that because you kept winning? I don't know if it's because I kept winning, but in the gambling community, we knew we can do that. We did that. Now we can't. Okay, so you're starting yeah. to make inroads into the community. Yeah, yeah. you're part of the commu- the gambling yeah. community now in well, it's Vegas. A, it's a small pool. You know, there's, there's only so many of us. And are, now, are you posting on Instagram? Like, mm-hmm. what what do the casinos get mm-hmm. out of giving you free stuff? Like, I didn't even have social media. Okay, so what yeah. is their incentive to? I guess because they you keep putting money down. I, I keep coming back. Yeah, and, keep and, coming and back. The, yeah, the law of large numbers. Eventually, I'm going to lose. Right. So while this is happening, they're giving me all this incentive. They go. Oh, New kids on the block, me and my buddy, 
putting down pretty big money. They don't, they're like, we don't care win or lose. Like we can afford right. either way, but it, it's going to get bigger. Give him more. Cause then he's going right. to give us more now. Okay. How long does this take? Six months, three months, about a year. Okay. Are you still at this point just having fun with yeah, your buddies absolutely. or are you thinking consciously, nope. Hey, no, come on, bro. You're too nope. smart for that. You're so, not thinking, Hey, if we go do this at the Baccarat table, we'll be able listen, to get this we, much out of it. We wanted to make money. We loved making money. We weren't going to Vegas to make money. We were hoping to make money. How much did you spend in the first year and how much did you make? Well, mm, I mean, it's, I don't know, simple math. 30 to 50K spend a week, mm -hmm. but 30 to 50K profit a week, roughly. Okay, you so know? that's 25 uh, million bucks. No, 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 no. No, no, we did less than that. Right? Is that the actual 50, math? 50K times 50 weeks. 50K a week times 50 weeks. No, we had, well, we had some losing 2. weeks. 2.5 million. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> we, Oops. we had losing you, weeks You can anyway. see I don't gamble much. Realistically, um, this is a guess. I'm making this up right now. Probably we made like a million bucks that year total. Yeah. Probably. Right. Probably. Okay. But I'm so, making that up. Like I don't, I didn't, I don't really, really know. We had losing weeks. Like again, yeah. we weren't going there. Okay. Thinking we're going to win. We we're going there just hoping to win. Right. Have a good time. Right. But then around, I'm going to uh, estimate it around the one year mark. We said to ourselves, this is going pretty well. <laughs> what happens if we put an extra zero behind our buy-in? And we're like, let's try it. So we did try it. So now we're buying in. 100, 200, 300,000, occasionally a half a million. But our cash outs also had another zero because we're still winning. We're still doubling the money. It's just unit sizing. So we still won at the same ratio. So now I'm winning 100, 200, 300, sometimes 500,000 in a week. And really quickly, this didn't last that long. Mm. Really quickly, we looked at each other and we go, this is something we need to pay attention now. Okay. And that's when we started taking it seriously. And that's when it no longer was for fun and we were there for business. It was work. Okay. So tell, tell us about how this converted into a business. What was the first, what was like the first hustle? What was the first conscious business move now that the money is like pouring in? Okay. So the first move was that we needed to be conscious of what we're doing. That was mm -hmm. the very first important thing. Cause in the beginning we weren't, we were just partying. We had the girls and like mm. strange, stranger, f new friends, right? And like trying all these new things mm -hmm. and new restaurants and new clubs and whatever the casino gave us, we were eating it up. We're like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, front row tickets, mm. floor seats, blah, blah, and just going with no like consciousness. So the first thing is we sat back and we go, what here is a trick? What here is a tool? We're like, okay, all of that's a trick. But this little piece here, that's a tool. So we're going to stop doing that, but we're going to build more on this. And then I told the casino, I go, hey, instead of giving me all this, can I just get more of this? Which was? Whatever it was. To be honest, I don't remember like the specific thing. It was like a collective, like small things. Like, uh, But what was the first trick though? What do you mean the first trick? Well, the first tool, excuse me. The first tool? Yeah. Like what was like your target? Oh, oh betting limits. Betting limits was the first tool. Okay. Okay. So you can negotiate betting limits depending on your deposit money, front money, or credit line. This was the, I'm sorry, that was the answer you're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, betting limits. Okay. I have one of the highest limits in Vegas history. Well, I did. I was allowed to bet $300,000 a hand in Baccarat, $75,000 a hand in a blackjack shoe, and $50,000 a hand in a double deck shoe. On the 75K a hand in the blackjack shoe, or I think it was an up to three hands of an aggregate of 75,000. Don't quote me. The truth is I didn't really play shoe. I played double deck and, ba and Baccarat. And on double deck, I had 50,000 a hand or an aggregate of 70,000 across three hands. It was like 50,000 for one, 35 for two or whatever, uh, or, and, or 25 for three. That was my breakdown on double deck. But when you walk in that into a casino, you only see what the sign says. That sign is for the general public. Yeah. That's for the ill-informed. Yeah, that's for the plebs. Peasants. Yes, right. That's for those that just don't know. And those limits are put there to abuse the players. Mm. So you can negotiate. So a guy, and I know a lot of guys, a lot of trappers do this actually. They have so much money and they don't have to do with it. Drug they, dealers. Yeah, drug dealers. Mm -hmm. They sit down at a table and they just start playing, right? And they go, oh, I'm only allowed to bet 10K. It's what the sign says. But they bought in for six figures. So 10K at a time, the most they could win, they, you think like how many hands you got to win mm -hmm. to make enough money for a guy who's making millions selling drugs, right? To, to have an effect on him. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. 
But if you sit there long enough, you will lose. Right. And you can lose it all 10K to hand, but you can't win it all 10K to hand. You know what I mean? Mm. So it's these guys are sitting there forever chasing a win that they will never get at $10,000 a hand. So you need to, to win, you need to have higher limits. limits. And that's what you had. Yeah. But why would the casino, knowing that, they must have known that, why would they give you a higher limit? So it's it's pretty standard protocol, right? And the reason they allow it is they think that everyone's still going to lose eventually. Mm -hmm. So if this guy's so rich and he wants to bet bigger, that means he's going to lose more and faster. Mm. But what happened with me was the opposite effect. I won more, bigger, faster, more. How? How? <laughs> so, start. Let's just let's just okay. focus on your two favorite games, mm -hmm. Baccarat and uh, and Blackjack. Mm -hmm. Start with Baccarat. Putting down three hundred thousand a hand. My nipples are getting hard I, right now. I'm just tingling. For, just for accuracy, I actually didn't take the deal to bet three hundred k a hand. I took the deal to bet two hundred fifty k a hand. Just for accuracy okay. of this of my reality. Right. Yeah. Excuse me. A, no. a mere quarter quarter rock a hand. A, yeah. a quarter million a hand. Yeah. What what uh, in back rat? What was your what was your tool? What was your advantage? Why well, I. I what did you do? I figured out how they cheated and I reverse engineered it. I have no idea what the f that means. Explain. So casinos deploy all these cheating tactics and they're, they're endless and they're so far and beyond. And the, there's like a blanket they use to screw with gen pop. Right. And most people fall victim to it. When, me and my guys saw all of the tricks and the little bit of tools. We saw pretty quickly when we erased all the tricks, a lot of the typical methods of manipulating a patron in a casino also vanished. And we saw right through it. And now we're staring face to face and we go, they were trying to trick us with that. I can't believe we fell for it for the first year. You know, and we go, okay, if they're going to trick us with that. What else are they going to trick us with? We started digging deeper and deeper. And as we got deeper into that on our own internally, mm -hmm. and we also started getting deeper into the gambling community. There's a sharp community. Do you know what that means? Mm -mm. Sharps? So a uh, gambling sharp is somebody who has an edge, right? They're guys that are backed off. Like there's a lot of sports sharps. There's a lot of, there's 90%. Sharps? I thought they were called sharks. Is that sharks. the same thing? No, no. Um, sim uh, kind of similar. Yeah, similar, similar. It almost means the same thing. Hang on, though. G yeah. give, it, give me an example of one way that a casino would cheat an average person playing Baccarat. Ah, I don't want to say. Why not? Well, I'm selling it for $50 million. You're sell oh, right. You're selling this as like a proprietary yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah. So who are you selling it to? Whoever wants it. Interesting. So you're kind of putting out that out there right now. So if there's any whales listening contact you realistically i think the casinos are gonna try to pay me off to tell to catch me if you can me wow. i think the casinos are gonna pay me to tell them what it is exactly i figured out they did and how did i reverse engineer it. and they're gonna try to prevent it from anyone else knowing okay so that's you, what i think is really happening so this is like an active thing right now this yeah. is like okay so you essentially would take one of these ways that they would you would identify these ways that they would cheat normal people and then you would just cheat them yeah, it's like using the same method. Yeah, it's like this. I imagine me and you were playing poker together and I knew you had an ace of spade in your sleeve, but you didn't know that I knew you had an ace of spade. That means every time there's an ace on the board, I know that you have a pair of aces, but you don't know that I know that. So when I have some random seven deuce in my hand and the flop comes ace seven deuce, you think your aces are the nuts. But the whole time I knew you had aces and I got seven deuce and I take all your money. Okay, so you're telling me allegedly yeah. that Vegas dealers have cards in their sleeves? That's not what I'm saying. Okay. That's not what I'm saying. It's much more sophisticated than that. It's I sophisticated and 94% of the time, the it, it's outside of the dealer. The dealer actually has no idea. They stay ignorant. They're they're uninformed of what's happening. They're being the, Usually what's happening is the dealers are being used as a tool wow. to cheat on behalf of the casinos that they're unaware of. Okay. And for many reasons, it's important the dealer is unaware that they're being used as a tool to cheat the player. Of course. Yeah. Of course. It was like the assassination of JFK. He was just a patsy. Right. Uh, sorry. Bad analogy. Anyways, yeah. who's in on it? The pit bosses? Pit bosses I in on the I think it's cheating? usually above the pit. I, so, so this is what I think. I think there's the higher up the ranks you go, the higher up involvement or awareness they have. So for example, let's say there are some dealers that are in on it, right? But let's say we're talking about the majority of dealers, like the kind of dealers that have social media, maybe they're young, will be watching this and comment. And I get this all the time. I'm a dealer and I definitely have never cheated. 
yeah, we know because they knew that you weren't capable of it. <laughs> yeah. So they wanted to make sure you're in the 94% of dealers that have no idea yeah. that you're being used as a pawn. Yeah, you're right? making 30 bucks an hour. Yeah. No, like, nobody needs you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They don't need you to cheat. You're not the one buddy, mm -hmm. right? So uh, oh, what was your original question? Oh, how high up they are. Yeah, yeah. okay, okay. So those guys, the 94% of dealers have zero knowledge, right? Zero pressure, zero understanding. They just think a guy's losing or a guy's winning and they don't know the difference. Mm. They're like, I hope this guy wins because if he wins, he's going to tip me. And the dealer probably truly thinks that and believes that. Mm -hmm. And they don't know anything else. Makes perfect sense. Right. So then there'll be, uh, let's call it a, a first pit boss, right? And that first pit boss knows very, very little except when an, a particular special player is there that they need to keep an eye on him and make sure he doesn't do any funny business, right? That pit boss is thinking, oh, Sometimes he wins big. Sometimes he loses big. People have sleight of hand. Let me just keep an eye, right? Mm. Then there's a pit boss above that. And that pit, pit boss was told, keep an eye on this pit boss and make sure that player stays at that table as long as possible. Now, they don't know why they want that player there. They're thinking standard. Oh, the longer they play, the longer they lose, the more they lose, let's get them drunk. Mm. What they really need is some time to implement certain cheats created for that exact player. But that pit boss doesn't know that. That pit boss thinks my job is to keep the player here. Give them comps, make sure there's a waitress always here, make sure the food is coming fast enough. Mm -hmm. Just, I was told, keep the player at the table, I'm going to keep him at the table. Right. You don't know why. And this guy, this second pit boss, he's the one actually looking at the cameras now? No, he'll be on the floor also. Okay, so he'll these guys the are still on the floor. Who's yeah. above that second pit boss? So then there comes another pit boss, right? And that next pit boss might be involved with the surveillance room. And from the surveillance room, they're keeping an eye on that player and maybe the player's entourage. What are they doing? Where are they going? How can we manipulate? We, how do we manipulate the whole group? How do we keep them long enough to implement a cheat we're trying to do? Are they catching on to one of the cheats? Have they without even being uh, conscious of it, figured out a way around the cheat. Because sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes there's very simple things they do that if you don't catch it, it'll take all your money. But if you catch it by pure, you just saw it, like you didn't think nothing of it, mm. you make a slight adjustment in the way you play. They go, okay, they figured that one out. Time for the next one. Call upstairs. And they call the next guy. Wh who is? It'd be like the, the, a lower ranking executive, for example. You okay. know? No, I'm not like sitting in the room next to these guys no, as they're I, doing this. No, I realize this. that, but I'm trying yeah. to I'm trying to put together this conspiracy. Like, who's benefiting? This is what I would. When you know I, what I mean? When I picture in my imagination this chain of communication, I'm mm -hmm. picturing ten people from the very top down to the dealer, ten in total, and that's in my imagination. I don't know if it's really ten. Could be a hundred. Could be five. I don't know. Mm, okay. But it starts at a dealer who doesn't know anything, and they're being used as a tool. Then it goes to a pit boss who hardly knows anything, yeah. also a tool. Then a slightly higher pit boss. Doesn't really know that much. Right. Also being used as a tool. Then it goes to surveillance. They know half. Right. Then it goes to a guy above them. Knows 80%. So it gets to a guy who's at the top making all of the decisions and putting all these other nine people in place to perfectly craft a position for right. the players to lose. So what you're saying is it is very likely that casino executives or general managers, people who are responsible for the win or the Rio or the Tropicana, are actually implementing and have an, uh, a mandate to cheat their customers. Without a doubt. There you have it, folks. Right from the horse's mouth. Mm -hmm. So you, what you're doing now is you're saying, them, you're identifying that cheat and fighting fire with fire, cheating yeah. back. Yeah. And it's working. I mean, I got a few tens of millions that said it worked. <laughs> Now here's the thing. Here's the thing. Let's let a lot of people, and rightly so perhaps, in the comments. If you give a f about the comments, people will say this is cap. This is yeah, sure, sure. Uh, one of the questions I had, I just want to put it to bed right okay. now. You're you're not the scion, the heir of actual casino owners, no, are you? No, no, no. Okay, okay. You saw that rumor so, floating around okay, the okay. internet. <laughs> so listen to this story. Let me tell you how the rumor got started. So stupid. My whole family forever is high stakes degenerate gamblers. I believe that. I, I have a great uncle who one time in a card game won a piece of a casino in a country. I have no idea what country. And within, I don't I don't know the timeline. I'm going to make this up. The rumor in my family is a couple of months. He then in another card game lost ownership of that casino. It was not, like my family doesn't own casinos. So like, that's your, not, your dad is in Sheldon Adelson. Definitely your, your not. Your dad's rest not, in, uh, no, yeah. def, <laughs> rest in peace. Rest in peace, Sheldon. Yeah, no, okay. definitely not. Definitely okay, not. Okay, so you're like, not the heir of, no, you're I'm not the great grandson of Mr. Wynn. No, no, I'm just okay. Steve Wynn. No, no, no. Steve no, Wynn. No, no, no. I'm okay. just some guy. 
Okay. Yeah. So this is not uh this is not cap. No, 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 no. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you gotta think, we've had so many casino executives, surveillance people. Uh, I've exposed my tax records, I've exposed all my win loss statements multiple times live on the air. All of it's on the internet. You can just like look it up. Like, and you do you do post pictures with, you know, uh, millions of dollars in cash. Yeah. Yeah, it's coming from somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so... I mean, casinos have came forward. I mean, it's not a secret. I, I won in casinos. It's not a secret. Have you yeah. ever had FBI approach you? Have you ever had IRS try to no. take you down? As a matter of fact, my taxes are the simplest taxes I've ever done in my life now when I was gambling. And they've been in my whole life. And I've seen a lot of taxes, talked to a lot of other business owners. My taxes are so simple as a professional gambler. The casino tells me how much I've won. That's what I owe tax on. Mm -hmm. It couldn't be simpler. How does that work? So do you have, were you gambling, were you putting your gambling money, your bank in an LLC? No. And no. running it through that way? No, how you're does actually, that, how you're do you structure to a do company? That. You're not supposed to do that. It's so, it's just, it's just, it's not even a company. It's just my personal. It's your personal. Yeah. It's okay. so simple. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. How, yeah. Uh, what was your bank? So you obviously you and your boy, your business partner are going in very disciplined now. Very, what yeah. was your mat? What was your personal we, limit? Your we bank? like we buy in for three million at a time. That was our sweet number. Three okay, million. Gotcha. and we negotiated with the casinos for my quarter million dollars a hand and fifty k double deck, a three million dollar buy in, which was fine because we like buying in for three million. And the reason, by the way, not that it matters, but the reason I didn't take the three hundred thousand a hand is because I'd have to buy in for five million. So for an exposure and a liability of an extra two million dollars, I only got the possible upside of fifty thousand dollars. So how'd I do that? I'd right. save two million dollars and yeah. a loss of fifty thousand. Right. It makes way more sense. Okay, so you're going in now as a business. No yeah. more around, yeah, no, no more no. having fun. Yeah, yeah. Became work. Yeah. What was a typical week look like? You worked every day? No. We also didn't work every week. We would, it came out, I was making, it came out to a net profit of $1 million a week for a long time, but it wasn't so cut and dry. It was like, we would live our lives. Mm -hmm. We were young guys with too much money mm -hmm. living in LA, right? And we just live our lives. We'd say to ourselves, time to go to work. We would, it, gr it gradually adjusted, but towards the end of it, we'd sneak ourselves into Vegas in cars we've never been in that aren't registered or rented or owned by mm -hmm. us. And uh, we'd go in there and we'd, so I'd get a, I used to store all these cashier's checks, right? Because they're good. Some of them are good forever. And if they're not good, when you have that kind of relationship with the bank, you just bring the check or I, I just, honestly, I just mm -hmm. text my banker to be honest, mm -hmm. but I text my banker. I go, yo, I got this $3 million check. It's nine months old. Can you renew it? And they go, yeah, no problem. We'll print you a new one, right? So I used to just store these checks. I didn't, I wasn't even sure. I'm not to this day sure that the banks aren't in communication with, with the casino to let them know this guy just came in, took a check for $3 million yeah. and yeah. we believe he's on the way to you because that would give them enough time to set something up for me to lose. Wow. So I would keep storage of all these Usually they're one, two, or $3 million checks. Oh, by the way, is that how a casino, when you make that much money, is that how a casino pays you out? It's not $3 million in cash. So so this is the law, because they got in trouble for this uh, not too long ago. They were acting as stand-in banks, which they did, the government didn't want. So what they do now is the law says, however you buy in, whatever form, cash, check, or wire, that's how they have to cash you out up to that amount. After that amount, you can make any requests you want. So for me, I would come with a $3 million check. I would say, keep this on hold. What that means is do not deposit it, mm. confirm the funds with the bank and just keep it in the drawer on the desk, mm. literally. All right. And they'll keep it like 72 hours or something. like. You can ask them to keep it as long as they you want, basically. Mm. But they basically just customarily hold it. I think it's like up to three days. They call the bank, confirm it's legit, all that. And they put it in the drawer right there at the, the high limit cage. It's not even like locked mm. up. It's just like there, mm -hmm. right? When you gamble, let's say I came in with a $3 million check. When I cash out $6 million, the first $3 million, they take the chips and they hand me back the check. They go, here's your check. Right. Go to your bank and refund it. I don't care what yep. you do with the check. We don't want it anymore. Mm. How do you want your other $3 million? My profit side. For me, I take cash. Mm. I've done the wire thing. Super weird. Super sketchy. There's like no paper trail. Yeah. They're like, all right, you should have it next week. And I'm like, whoa. I'm like, what? Am I going to give me a document? They go, <laughs> what do you want? A receipt? I'm like, yeah, something. You yes. Know? Yeah. <laughs> For three million bucks. Yeah. So what happens with the wire is you just go to the cage and she's just some girl, right? Like mm -hmm. who's never touched three million in her life type, you know, whatever. It's a girl works at like a cashier. She takes all the information, puts it in the computer and goes, okay, thank you. Goodbye. Right. You're like, whoa, 
easy, young lady. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, I need yeah. three million bucks, you know? <laughs> and I go, so what's happening now? And she goes, well, I put it in the in the computer. So it's going to go to the uh, financial department. I forget their, whatever they're called. Whatever Accounting? they're called. Accounting? Yeah, yeah. But there's even one before that, bro. It has to go to like three departments before it even makes it to the guy uh, that actually hits the send wire so button. So it's got to go through all of this bureaucracy. All of it. And you don't know where, where your yeah. funds in that process right. are. So you're just right. praying the money yeah. shows up. And then if you take a check, they can also cancel a check and they have a little while to do this. So for me, yeah. give me the cash. Right. In case you have any discrepancies with how I won the money or mm -hmm. you think I'm cheating mm -hmm. or whatever it is, that's fine. You want to take me to court? No problem. Yeah. Pay me now. Right. We can fight it out in court later. By the way, I'm going to use the cash you gave me to pay for the court proceedings. And that's a Nevada law. They have to pay you out like, like you just said. They have to give you the money. Yeah. So they have to give how you- How you want it. Well, only the profit. They have right. to give you what you bought in for in right. the same form you bought it. And but, clearly, you know by now, these casinos are, are it's in their mandate to cheat. So they're not above screwing you over in like a wire. Yeah, yeah, so, exactly, exactly. So therefore, Bro, you take cash. The, the last time I was allowed to play in Vegas with no bar is when I won. It was my happened to be my biggest single session win. I won $11,526,000. In one session. Playing how many games and uh, which games? This is Baccarat? Exclusively Baccarat? How many hands Exclu is that? Well, I'm not sure. 250. We, what we did was we 250 threw, divided by 11 million or whatever. Yeah, whatever it is. Plus yeah. commission. There's 5% commission on roughly 55% of the hands. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And that's a that's also a rule? That's a rule, yeah. Okay. Well, you could also play commission-free. I don't, but there is a commission-free option. It actually costs you more money in the long run. There's an, It's just another version. Simply put, I play the version where on roughly 55% of my hands, I'm paying 5% back to the house. <laughs> okay, so you got 11 million. You take 11 million in cash? No. So this was the very last time they let me play with no bar. It's just like, like free for all. And you and won't say what casino this is that you wanted at? It was two casinos. Tell us, tell us, tell no, us. No, I'll tell you off the air. You no, know, give, give us the exclusive. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I posted the checks before. Okay, so I won uh, eight and a half million from MGM Grand. <sighs> and the balance, which was like 2.64, something like that, was from Palazzo. Let's go. I, I assume yeah. you're not let in there anymore. Definitely not. Not even close. Yeah. I can't even go on the sidewalk. I forgot. If you look, I did post a photo of these checks. Wow. So it, in the checks, it, if, if you know what you're looking at, you can see one of them right. says the Sands, which right. is the Palazzo in Venetian. Yeah. And the other says MGM Grand, which is MGM Grand. So, so if you look at the checks, I did post it. Yeah. So you're like a hero of the degenerate gambler community. You yeah. like beat Vegas. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So I'm sorry to cut you off. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, 11 million, uh, yeah, tell us how you move that. And do you have bodyguards at this point? Yeah. Okay. There's so much to the story. Like we do, we could do a whole pod of course. just on this story. Yeah. So I'll give you the short version. Um, they had fought me tooth and nail, like this whole way, right? So we were, we feel, me and my guys are feeling really cornered. We're like, we don't think we're going to metaphorically make it out alive, right? We weren't actually in fear of our lives. Plus we faced death like when we were like living recklessly, like we weren't, we're not actually fearful of that. Right. Mm. But metaphorically, we didn't know if we we're going to make it out alive. We didn't know if we we're going to win, make it out with our money. Like we didn't know if we had an escape plan here. So what we did was we threw a seven day long party and it was one of the most outrageous parties that I or any of the people there had ever seen. We had a thousand people in attendance at any given time, 24 hours a day for seven days Where at? in Vegas, in the MGM, uh, in the mansions, in the villa. So I had the villa, it was 10,000 square feet. We had two indoor pools. It was the whole top floor of the mansions. So at the place that you took all that money from, yeah. you were also partying at. Yeah. So, but we <laughs> did it on purpose. We wanted to serve as a distraction. So many celebrities were there. All the tabloids, all the media outlets. It was a spectacle. And this is just when I started social media. So if you like look what? back and you do a little digging, you'll, you'll uncover all of the uh, like media that, that ended up coming from this right. party. So what happened was we had all these like, famous people and non-famous people and whatever, just people, right? Doing crazy things, lighting fires, orgies, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And what's happening is in my head, again, I don't know how many people there really are. In my head, they are assigning 10 executives to me at all times when they're alerted I'm on property. I believe there's 10 people upstairs watching me mm -hmm. 24 hours a day. So I said, if there's 10 people, probably any one of them is smarter than me one-on-one -on -one, and I have to deal with 10 of them. They'll outsmart me every time. What can I do to lighten the load? How do I fight against less of them? 
So we threw this party and we gave everybody the tools to make the biggest problems possible. <laughs> so all the, so the, all they know is there's a thousand people in Mickey's villa. There's a fire. We need to call the fire department. Who lit the fire? The guy who just won the world championship in UFC. What do we do now? So out of these 10 executives, five of them now have to deal right. with this celebrity who literally just came close yeah. to burning down a casino in my party. So now I'm only fighting half the amount right. of people I'm supposed to fight. Wow. And me and my guy would sneak out the back. We'd hit the tables before those five can even catch up. So you're working. Yeah, working, you're working, the working this time. whole time. The whole time. Wow. Okay, I want to take a step back for a second. Yeah. Um, how long into uh, you basically started to take gambling seriously. Mm -hmm. How long before the casinos turned on you? In that second year, roughly at month 18. So this, the relevant part of my gambling career mm -hmm. took place over three years. Yeah. The first year was where I told you we were buying in for 30 to 50 and doubling up, but we didn't care about winning. Yeah. It was nice that we were winning, but we didn't care. The second year is where we started to take it serious, where we added a zero to everything. And the third year is we are bar none, going to work and we'll do everything we can to take these casinos down. Roughly at the 18 month, 18 month mark in the three years, mm. which is halfway through our second year, mm. where we're doing the six figures, entering seven figures, that's where it starts to become a problem. Okay. Tell us about how you noticed them starting to f*** with you. Well, they started to do things like, they took my jet away. And I'm like, what'd you take the, the jet away for? And they go, well, you're not bringing in enough money. And I go, what? I go, I'm the biggest better in the city for the last six months. And they go, well, it's not enough. I go, that's suspicious. So they would send a jet to LA to pick you up and no, fly they you in? gave me a jet to go anywhere, do anything. I used to take it to go check my mail. I used to go, one time I threw a party and I just took it, a party and I had a hat in LA at my crib that I wanted to wear to the party. I just took the jet to LA. I told, when I landed, I told the pilot, I said, don't leave the plane. I'll be right back. My driver was on the tarmac in LA at, at Van Nuys, drove me straight to my crib. I ran inside, grabbed a hat. <laughs> driver took me back to the tarmac got him, and went to the party. I just used it like it was an Uber. I used PJs like it was an Uber. They took that away. And I go, that's weird. I'm the biggest, better... I'm the biggest depositor in the city yeah. for six months. Yeah. And there's so many jets these casinos own. Like, why would you take mine away? It's mm -hmm. a weird thing mm -hmm. to take away from me. Then they'd be like, I'd, I'd say, hey, I want to go to this this villa. They go, can't give it to you. <laughs> Who are you going to give it to? Somebody else. I go, well, there's nobody more valuable to you in pure numbers mm -hmm. than me. Mm -hmm. Why would you give that premium villa to somebody else? Because I'm like, that's suspicious. So we started to see this. Then they started to do weird little things like harass me or bust my balls. Or I had a parking space at the front door of every casino on the strip. So I would just self park and keep my keys. Mm -hmm. They started busting my balls with that and cornering me and just all it just, you could just see. Yeah, it was like little harassments, yeah. little things that were like taking away. Like microaggressions. So why, I got a question, you know, this is yeah. a private business. Couldn't they just ban you outright so for, for any reason? They, they could and eventually they did. I believe that they were very torn. I think out of the 10 executives mm -hmm, watching me, mm -hmm. five said, he's cheating in a liability, get him out. And the other five said, we can't catch him cheating. We haven't figured out any unethical play he does. He's just so lucky. Keep him a little longer. He's got to give it all back. So I think it was this fight. So they go, uh, well, where's the common ground? And they go, what if we just shake the pot a lot? And someone goes, well, how are you going to shake his pot? They go, let's take away everything he likes. Let's start with that. Yeah. So they took away all the stuff I like. And it did shake my body. It got me pissed off. I was like, you just are very, incon you're inconveniencing me a right. lot now. And they go, okay, he's still winning though. What else can we do? And that's when it started getting crazy. They go, jam his Wi-Fi. Make sure he has no cell mm. service. Now I can't use my cell. My, no cell phones work in my, any of my villas or my rooms. Wow. Like, no, now, now and what? they have that capability. That's like yeah. the NSA or something. That's so like high level government. It's, it's, it's actually not that hard. Technology. So I had spoke about it years ago in an interview. And all these people said, no, it's impossible. You can't jam. Why? Da, da. First of all, I'm not a technician. Let me just be super clear, right? So I don't know all the correct terms. What I know is that if there's two rooms that share an adjoining wall, one's in my name, one's in your name. Mm -hmm. The one in your name, you have flawless cell phone capabilities. Mm -hmm. As soon as you go four feet into my room, your phone is now a paperweight. And I put it to the test. And then I recorded a video doing it. And when I recorded this video, it got like, I don't know, like 10 million. I, I recorded it at night, mm -hmm. went to sleep, woke up in the morning, like 10 million views. That casino knocked on my door and told me to leave. And I recorded that too. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, oh, but, but, I'm, but what I'm sorry, what I meant to say is um, people had contacted me because uh, they also uh, locked me in an elevator one time. 
And I posted the video from the elevator. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm locked in here. You know, I, I was I was with Odell Beckham. We were gambling. I went, we both separated to go to our room for the night. When I got in the elevator, I got locked in there. And it was like a whole thing. Both an elevator, uh, I don't know, builder, technician, I don't know mm -hmm. what. And uh, many people that are, I don't know what the term is, familiar with how... They explained it to me that it's like a net, sort of like this light is, right? A net. What they can do is they can shut off certain parts of the net. So so you can't get the cell to go yeah. through that area. Right. So all these people that came forward and said, yeah, I can block that. If I was in the tech room right. or whatever, the casino, he goes, it's a pretty simple task. Oh. I personally can just block it. Right. They go, and same with the elevator guy. So the elevator guy took my elevator video. He stitched it on TikTok with him in an elevator room pulling the levers to lock mm -hmm. somebody in an elevator. That's believable. Yeah. That's totally believable. Well, not the comments. Well, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, at what point do, now you're posting on Instagram, you're becoming an influencer. Uh, at what point do the celebrities come in and start giving you their money to gamble with? Um, Like immediately. I, like as soon as I started social media, it immediately went viral. Who were the, who were the people, the first people that approached you? I think Drake was the very first person. I think Drake had discovered me like a week later it was Lil Baby. And then after that. Was, and they just DM you? Yeah. What and does like, a DM from Drake look like? Can I see it? No, I, <laughs> I don't want to do that because I, I think that he's very private. And I think that he prefers people not to like use his name for right. clicks and stuff like that. So, was that wild though? Seeing like, wow, I got. This is how it started. I was homeless in yeah. Harlem and now I got Drake and my DMs. Yeah. It's, it's, want me to gamble his money. Can you say the, the, the amounts of money? Can, can you say that? Like I can't put a name a name to the amount, but some have given me three million. Some have gone as low as like ten k. Like, but 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 in the beginning, I was just some guy, bro. And I'm still some guy. Mm. You know what I mean? But back then, I was some guy. I had like ten thousand followers on Instagram and no other social media. And um, when anybody who I liked or like listened to their music or watched them in movies would DM me, every time I was like, "Whoa, that's cool!" I like show my buddy, I'm like, "Yo, look," yeah. you know. And I'm like, hey, what's up, bro? Like, what can I help you with? You know, whatever I said. And they'd be like, we should go gamble. For me, I was just so taken back that they even knew who I was. And then went all the way as to ask me to hang out. You know, like there's so many things that have to happen for that to be the result. Yeah. That I was so like just a taken back that I was like, whatever you want to do, I'm just shocked that you want to hang out or like know who I am or whatever. You want to gamble? Sure, let's gamble, you know? Yeah. And so we started doing that. But pretty quickly, I became this... Um, like figure in that culture, yeah. you know, that now, like, you know, I just came right now from Rod Wave and Tusi, you know what I mean? Like nobody asked me to gamble. They just, they're just my boys. Yeah. Just being around and being in the scene, they got to know me not as a gambler, but as a human being. Yeah. And they're like, bro, you're dope. They're like, we, we like the same things, right. you know? So, so people were essentially just flying into Vegas just to, to hang out and, and gamble with you. Yeah. So it wasn't like a, Hey, I'm using this as like an investment you know, triple my money. Would you have anybody some, that did that? Yeah, some people, but those are the people that don't understand gambling mm -hmm. because I can lose and I do lose. Like mm -hmm. I have losses, you know? And so the people that are like, let me just wire you this money, send me back, send it back when you triple it, you know, in two hours. Yeah. In the beginning, I was willing to engage because again, I was just so like surprised they knew who I was and I was so like almost starstruck, yeah. you know? And yeah. I was just like, yeah, no problem. And then um, I saw like, they don't understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. So, once I, sort of the star struckness like wore off yeah. and I was just like a regular friend with these guys, mm -hmm. it became really easy for me to tell people no. Yeah. Every day, many, you know, very famous people are like, mm -hmm. hey, can we do this? And I'm like, you know what? Nah. Yeah. You know, if you want to like meet me, like I'm going to this show. If you want to come to the show and hang out, we can chat. Yeah. And if we become friends, we become friends. But like Nah, like I'm not a circus monkey. You're right. not gonna, you're not gonna just be like, here's some money. Like yeah. I'm like, bro, I'm good. You got I, your own money. Yeah, I'm, you got I'm your good. Own thing going on. Yeah. So once, once I felt that I was welcomed in that culture, that community, or became like a little bit of a celebrity in my own right, mm -hmm. I didn't need that, or the starstruckness wore off. I was just chilling, and I'm do, chilling. Do you remember a big loss that you took for uh, with somebody else's money that you felt bad about? Yeah, yeah. There, there was um, one in particular. That's what happened, bro. I, I can't say who it is on the air. I can tell you after. So a friend maybe of mine, on the Patreon, maybe perhaps. Yeah. Okay. So I have a friend. He's a rapper, very famous, and we were friends for like a while, right? And never once talked about gambling. 
we were just friends. Like we were always at the same parties, the same club, the same show. We were just there. And we were anytime we were there, we just link. Sometimes we'd go out, just me and him, whatever. Finally says to me one day, he goes, Hey, um, you want to gamble? And I go, sure. I got this game in LA. Like we can pull up. He goes, all right, can I, can I give you 50 K? Right. And a relative 50 K is not a lot. Mm -hmm. Right. But this was like a particular loss I felt bad about. So he's like, okay. I was like, yeah, I don't, whatever you, I was like, I don't care, bro. I'm just, I'm just hanging out. I'm going to go, I'm playing cards whether you're there or not. Like, I don't care. Right. He goes, I'll come and I'll throw 50 K in the mix. I'm like, all right, cool. We shows up. It's quite an environment, a lot of women and party favors and other like types of famous people. Mm -hmm. And it's a cool environment. And he had, I didn't know, but he'd never been, I didn't know. We never had talked about it. I didn't even realize, you know, I always give a disclaimer like, Hey, we can lose. Just know that, you know, and mm -hmm. Everybody says the same thing. They go, yep, I get it. I go, all right, cool. I didn't realize that he didn't realize what I was really saying. Like he heard the words, but didn't listen to the words, mm -hmm. right? Mm. And it's because he's never gambled a day in his life. He's never placed a single wager. And I didn't know that. So I'm giving him the disclaimer just like as friends. I'm like, hey, bro, I'll do it. You want to bring 50? I don't care. You could bring none and just hang out. But if you, he said, no, 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 I want to make money. I go, okay, well, hold on. Mm. Hopefully we make money, but just know like we are gambling. There's a chance we lose. Mm -hmm. He goes, yeah, 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 I'll go. I'm going to bring 50. I'm going to bring 50. We're going to make some money. We're going to party. And I'm thinking like, oh, he's just like hype, positive manifestation. Like, yeah, we're going to win. We're going to, all right, whatever, bro. Come on. So he comes, we sit down. I play one hand. We win like 17K this pot. It was, it was, we were playing Omaha, right? We won 17K. I'm breaking the chips. He's sitting next to me. I go, yo, we, we just won that one with 17K. He starts like chilling. He's like, ah, give me a shot. He goes, hey, one of you whores, get over here, yeah. rub my back, you know? And he's like, chilling, whatever. Like 30 seconds goes by and I lose a hand. And he goes, what happened? And I go, oh, we lost that one. We lost like 30K on that. He goes, oh, I thought we won 17. And I go, yeah, the last hand we did, you know what do you mean? He goes, well, you thought it was over? But because he's never placed a wager before, right. he didn't understand what was happening. We ended up losing the 50K, right? Mm -hmm. And he was so distraught. Now, the guy's got tons of money, right? So it's not the money. And this is something a non-gambler will never understand. The emotional hangover of taking a loss of any size. So for a week, he was calling me every day like, hey, bro, like, I don't feel good. He's like, I feel sick. How do I get over this feeling? Wow. And that during that week is when I realized he's never placed a wager. And finally I asked him, I go, bro, have you, do you gamble? And he goes, no, I don't know how. And I go, man, like this is not, this is not the world for you. Right. Did you, you see know? any real degenerate gamblers, like addicted, really bad, like, like a disease, like being addicted to drugs? Yeah. A, f a famous people or anybody. I've seen both, honestly. Both. Yeah, I've seen both. I've seen both, yeah. I've seen both, yeah. Wow. But I'm a honestly. Did you I'm have to cut people off? Did you have to tell yeah, celebrities like, "Hey, you're yeah. you're not in a good way. Yeah, I don't want to do time. this for you because because I don't need their money. I don't need like whatever we're about to win. Maybe like that doesn't even affect my bottom line. So for me, it's more important like their well being yeah. than anything. And I'm a friend before I am mm -hmm. like a gambler, you know. Yeah. And I discourage gambling. I have this a foundation where you know, at no cost at all, anybody who struggles with gambling addiction, drug mm -hmm. addiction, or mental health, they just have to reach out to my foundation. We find them treatment totally for free. So like, I'm a big advocate for not gambling. Honestly, it ruins endless lives yeah. and saves only a couple, like yeah. hardly any. And enriches a bunch of people that are cheating you in yeah, Vegas. Yeah, scumbags, yeah. Okay, uh, and tell us really quick about the games you had in LA. I think you still currently have them? Look, have is a, uh, not the right word. Uh, we snitch on this podcast, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, play in is a better way to phrase it. <laughs> okay. Tell us about these games. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're cool. There's all different ranges. Like I private. They're private. private, private games? All private, private location, uh, no like plus one, no cameras. All everybody all well, all the girls sign an NDA and have to hand their phone into the locker before they walk in. Um, the men are all high profile men. There's very little female players in this network. There are some. Uh, there are also high um like ranking women yeah. as well. A lot of them are politicians or um pretty famously known CEOs wow. or founders or actors and singers and producers and, you know, people that prefer discretion yeah. and privacy. And, and I don't disagree. At do all. you run them or do you just participate in them? I don't know anybody who runs them. Got it. Okay. Can you elaborate on that? I'll ask you again. <laughs> do you, <laughs> do you own them or do you just, if one were to own them, because mm -hmm. Clearly somebody owns them, right? Like in th this world exists in mm -hmm. the world of Mexican cartels in LA, some guy, El Mago, 
who was connected with the Sinaloa cartel. He was just murdered outside of one. They're called casitas. And they're private parties where rich business owners, drug dealers, money launderers go to have whores, gamble, that's a slightly different. That's a slightly different world. So the casitos okay. is more like low-level stuff, like street gangs, cartel, like that. Yeah. I the the ones that I'm fam- I'll use the term familiar with are a much different world. Very uh, upscale. clean, sure. upscale. There's no violence. There's no of crime. There's no drug dealers. There's no right. Yeah. I just want to know: Are they? I assume these are illegal. Who owns them in general? Well, I just it, want to know the it's structure. It's actually not illegal. So. Playing poker is not illegal. What's illegal is running an unlicensed casino. Mm. So there is a very fu- uh, very clear line mm-hmm. of when you're playing poker and when you're running an unlicensed casino. So as long as you're not running an unlicensed casino, there's no crime being committed. So these games that you attend or go to, they're licensed? No, but they're not a casino. Okay, so you can... It's, it's essentially, it's guys playing poker. It's, it's really just... Fr- it could just be friends. It friends in a house playing poker exactly is not right. illegal. That's not illegal. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Um, great. Let's get back to uh, how it all kind of ends with you in Vegas. So they're with you, uh, you know, harassment, cutting off your Wi-Fi, trapping you in elevators. Um, what year, how did you eventually get banned? It happened gradually over the last 18 months of, mm-hmm. of that three-year span. It started gradually. Some were just like, don't come back. Some that I walked in for the first time ever, when I walked in, they, they would greet me with security and say, your action's too strong, please leave. Um, wow. Some would do crazy things. Some would make false claims. I had one that told me I touched too many forks in the high limit buffet. There's like a lounge, like a buffet kind of, and like all the forks are like out, you know? And I swear to God, I bring in cash. And this on this, this particular casino has two high limit rooms. There's one on the first floor, which is standard. Then they have like a super high limit room, Mm -hmm. very private. It's on the second floor. And it's got its own name. It's got its own entrance. It's a whole thing. And that's where I like to play in this particular building. It's quiet and there's nobody in there. It's very private. I like that. I don't need to, I don't like distractions. I don't like the, any of that. So um, I bring in cash and where the cage is, is right next to this lounge where the players can just like, there's like just a food option, snacks, Mm -hmm. buffet style, whatever. And so I put my cash at the cage. I know it's going to take them a while to count it. I'm watching. I go, I'm going to hop over to the lounge while you count. So I'm in the lounge and I'm eating, getting food. I just peek my head around the corner. I see they're still counting. No problem. I get greeted with like a group of security. They go, are you Mickey Mace? I go, can I help you with something? They go, are you him? I go, what's the problem? They go, you touch, swear. They go, you touch too many forks. I go, what's the limit of forks I can touch? <laughs> <laughs> and they go, just to be clear, are you Mickey Mace? And I go, yeah, I am. Dude rips out this freaking index card like it's the biggest FBI bust of the mm-hmm. century. And he's standing in a power stance reading me my Miranda rights for the casino. Yeah. It's a trespassing. Like yeah. it's a thing uh-huh. they, they always read. And the guy's, re- there's like t- 10 security guards there. And this guy in a power stance just barking at this index, barking off at this index card. And I'm like, what's the problem, fellas? You know? <laughs> yeah. And though the problem is you touch too many forks. We need to escort you to your car and follow you off property. Are you guys being serious? And they go, yeah, if you have a problem with it, call your host and you guys handle it on your own. And how much cash did you brought in? It was like 300K, which wasn't even a lot. I was just right. going for, I was early in the morning. That's I was light just killed. Work. Yeah, I was just going for some fun. So they ban me for touching too many torque, too too many forks in the in the. Lounge. So they don't give you an official like you're you're 86 from no, here. They give me those. I never accept them. I don't think it works this way. But I'm assuming if I never accept it, then I can claim like negligence or even ignorance. Like right. I don't have a piece of paper. I'm, I never touched a piece of paper. But they always try to give it to you. Right. They, it's like one of those three pieces where it's like the pink, the yellow, and the white. Mm-hmm. The ink goes through all three. Mm-hmm. They always try to rip one off and give you one. But I'd never take one. Are you in litigation with any of these places? No. Okay. No. Are there any places? I wasn't you- cheating. I, I, if I was cheating, your first offense for cheating in uh, the state of Nevada is five years in state prison. Holy. First offense. Wow. I've never been indicted. I've never been in pr- prison for cheating. I, it's never. I didn't cheat. Never cheated. So are there any places that you can still go to? There's two buildings in Las Vegas I'm allowed in. I think one of them doesn't really want me there. So like I try not to stir their feathers. I'll mm-hmm. go there for like dinner or like a show. And there's another one that doesn't really care. And I think the reason they don't care is because for my own strategy, 
and I don't need to, I don't play that big. There's only one spot. So if something ever goes wrong there, I don't have like a backup plan. Like mm -hmm. I don't have a an, an insurance policy, like mm -hmm. an insurance plan, you know? So I don't play that big there because I don't want to feel cornered. And also I don't have to. And it's really stressful. So knowing that it's my only spot, that every time I have to bring, every time a celebrity calls me and asks me to bring them to Vegas, this is the spot we go. So I think they reap the benefits of the biggest names in the world walking into their doors. It's good promotion for them. Yeah, but they only walk into that set of doors because I'm the one that brought them there, you know? So I think that, and this is not confirmed. Like, yeah. I don't know. And the casino doesn't pay me. That's, I wish they did, but they right. didn't. They should. So how often are you out there, you know, since um, you can only go to one spot? effectively well i still have like a life in vegas like i own a house there yeah. i still have like a life there so i go yeah who what's the most interesting cat celebrity that you ever gambled with i don't know i played with a lot of people i played with a lot of people anybody that like su would surprise us yeah he's a, a mayor of a pretty big california city really yeah i can't say who but yeah like all the time like all the time wow all the time <laughs> So you're at the you're at the table with power with political power. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah tell yeah. them to clean San Francisco up, please. Yeah. I, I, chick, we don't. But. We, I never want to cross that line. You know, I never want to try to influence any political stance yeah. on anything. That's not. I'm not a politician. I'm not here for. I don't have a motive. Mm -hmm. I don't have a motive. I don't want to get in murky waters. Have you been approached by you know drug dealers, trappers, yeah. criminals that want you to launder for them? Yeah, all the time, but. I always say no. Plus, plus, if I do lose for one of those guys, the repercussions is way more severe than losing to like an NFL player, NBA player. Right, like those right. guys are so rich, they're like ah, no big deal. Like, yeah. But to lose to like you know like gang bangers and stuff like that, like mm -hmm. there could be repercussions. I don't need that. I also don't need the implications that come with trying to clean their money. I don't have to clean anybody's money. Yeah. I don't have to do that. Right. So why would I Risk walk it. into that? Yeah. Right. For what? What What do you think in your three years of playing there? What do you think your win to loss percentage was? It's a little bit of a trick question. So overall, I'm 100% a winner because you can only be a winner or a loser, right? But more realistically, while it was happening, I won in real life 80% of my sessions. 80% of your hands? My sessions. Se okay, sessions. Yeah, yeah. Sessions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Have you been... What's a, What now? What now? You, you, you trying to sell the algorithm? No, I set the bar so high. I'm hoping no one tries to buy it. There's a few inquiries. There's a few people in communication, but I, I set that bar blindly from day one because I there's a few reasons. First, I do not want to encourage gambling. Even if somebody pays me the $50 million, that's not a casino and it's like a person who wants the sauce, yeah. right? Even if they pay me 50 million, if they do any, anything, the smallest thing, not exactly how I'm telling them to do it, which is going to happen. Mm. I can't imagine a guy's going to remember like every verbiage, noun, location, time, like every detail. It's so extensive that he's, he, somebody's going to make a mistake somewhere along the way, mm -hmm. which means they paid me $50 million and they made a mistake on the algorithm, which is just what I, I just call it the algorithm, right? Which means they're still losing at the tables. And I don't want to feel responsible for that. That who knows what not just legal repercussions I can have, but emotional. Like I don't need, I don't want to take that kind of weight on. There's no need for that. And um, the last thing is if it gets out exactly what I've done, the casinos will change it. Yeah. And that 50 million somebody just gave me went to waste. Yeah. Right. Well, you imagine they must change it all the time though. You know? I think what they're doing is they're changing it. Instead of having an ace, ace in their sleeve, they put a king. After they put a king and they think that they've been outed, they put a queen. After they put a queen, they put a jack. Then they go back to an ace, but instead of an ace of spades, it's an ace of heart mm -hmm. this time. So I think they're still, I mean, I know they are. They're still running the same racket with slight variations, but they're also solvable. Once you understand how to solve it, what the algorithm is, mm -hmm. it's really easy to solve it no matter what cards. So maybe that's what you sell. Yeah. And you only sell it to the right person. Yeah. Somebody who can handle that kind of power. Yeah. What's your next, what do you want to do? I know you're acting now, you're in movies. Yeah. Uh, you know, amateur, uh, adult star, <laughs> you know, you finally made it come true, my man. Look at that, dude. Yeah. Uh, what do you, what, what do you see the next 10 years looking like? I think I'm, I think I'm going to be doing more and more acting. I mean, I got so many movie roles and TV roles so quickly and I'm not an actor just to be like super clear, right? Like I'm not an actor. Uh, I don't have training, like whatever that, Without trying, without auditioning, without anything, I got casted as so many things, 
like and a lot of these so a lot of them knew that I was willing to do it or wanted to like get into the movies and stuff and some of them don't know that some of them was just like people just hitting me up like you have a, the right look or the right char yeah. charisma or whatever it is you'd be a good fit for what we're filming so if that can all happen so quickly in su such a high level so fast that I'm just thinking like if I just try who knows like where the, the acting thing will get. And the Hollywood thing has been fun. Like being in movies and TV shows has been really fun so far. Yeah. Yeah. When you don't need it for money, acting mm -hmm. in Hollywood, it's a fun, it's a fun life, you yeah. know? And I think you've got a good financial basis now. Yeah. So are your parents proud of you? <laughs> the uh, people back home? I mean, he's the Jersey kid made good, you know? Yeah. Before we get into the rest of this, can I use a restroom again? No, can, we're going to wrap. Okay. We're gonna, I think we got, you know, I think we had like, uh, an amazing podcast. We're going to, we'll talk a little bit on the Patreon. Uh, but yeah, let, tell them, tell them where, where they can find you, you know, um, if there's anything you want to plug, let's do it. Sure. Uh, oh, the innocence project. Yes, of course. Yeah. As you know, I would only take this interview. I don't take appearance fees, but I do request that you donate to the innocence project. Absolutely. You told me you already do. You're involved. In yes. It. That's yes. amazing. Every year I give money to the innocence project. That of course is, uh, you know, a foundation for a nonprofit for lawyers, who are working mm -hmm. on getting innocent people out of prison who've been wrongly convicted. Yeah. It's my favorite charity. It's Me too. The, literally the only charity that I give to. Sure. Uh, so I absolutely will be donating again uh, in my good faith for having you on. Yeah. And I encourage everybody to go do that. You, I don't know if I told you, but when I pass, my will has signed the majority of my st estate over to the Innocence Project. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Hopefully that's not for a long time. I hope it's not for a long time. Uh, but when it does happen, the majority of my estate does get donated to them. And yeah. you've lived a full life. But yeah. It does. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, uh, they, the foundation I started, uh, we don't accept donations. I don't need anybody's money. I don't want anybody's money. Mm. I just want to help people at no cost if they struggle with mental health, drug addiction, or gambling addiction. It's called Shaken Hearts. They can just find it on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Just go to at Shaken Hearts, send a DM, and the rest is, rest you'll figure it out. Like, just send a DM to Shaken Hearts on Instagram and th they'll get with somebody. Great. Um, they can find me on all social media platforms at Dirty Goth Boy, and boy is spelled B-O-I. Oh, yeah, and I heard too, uh, you... Gamble with your fans' money? No, actually, it's the opposite. I fund with my money all my fans' gambling. That's something new I've been doing. We do it for a couple months, and it is going exquisitely well. Uh, exceptionally, exceptionally so. Uh, so I'm banned and I can't gamble, but my right. fans aren't banned. Right. Right. And because I have such a high converting win rate, most of my fans don't. They're like regular gamblers, losers. Right. Uh, I found a way to fund all their gambling. And on the losses, I pay 100%. And on the wins, we split the profit. Okay, so you're almost like uh, your own gambling site. You're like prize picks or something like that. You're like, but, but I don't sell anything. Like all those guys sell stuff. I don't, I do the opposite. I don't sell. I'm giving my money to the fans. I'm literally funding all their gambling, everything. Wow. So yeah, how everything. do you morally, as a guy that doesn't want people to gamble, how do you sleep at night? Well, there... <laughs> Uh, I sleep great. Uh, I sleep on an orange <laughs> a sleep. Bunch of money. <laughs> I sleep on an orange sleep mattress with four pillows. I just got new sheets. Actually, they're great. <laughs> Congrats, yeah. dude. Yeah. Doesn't matter how much money I get. I don't change my sheets, but once a year, I'm a dude. <laughs> no. Uh. So people are gonna gamble anyway, despite my super clear dis d disclaimer. Mm -hmm. Don't gamble. But they're gonna gamble anyway. Yeah. And the ones that do, at least let me help them make money instead of just giving these people uh, the casinos money. So I'm funding all of it. So even if they're like a degenerate gambler or whatever it is, it's my money as long as it's done my way, which is the way it's set up. There's, I, I, I can tell you off the air, not on the air, exactly how it's being done, but everything's done exactly the way I want it to be done, 100% on my dime. So if there are any losses, which there are sometimes, 100% of it I'm financially responsible for. And on the winning side, I split it with my fans. Wow. Okay. So you, if I came to you and say, Hey, I got 50 bands I want to spend. I would say, no, I don't want your money, but I'll give you 50 bands right. and you gamble the way I'm telling you to gamble. And how would you tell me a lay person, like a guy who goes to Vegas twice a year, I play the slots and some blackjack. Like I'm real novice. I, what would you tell me to do? Well, I can't give that sauce exactly here, but the way in my, in, in the, if you're talking about the business that I'm doing, the way we're doing it is it happens over time. Uh, we have to build a relationship. It's too much at once. Plus I can't, even if let's say 50,000 was how much I was willing to give you. Let's pretend the yeah. truth is if you're just a stranger and you contact me through my link, I'll give you the link. If you post it in this thing. So all yeah. these people can sign yeah. up too. You can also, by the way. Okay. 
I can't just give every stranger $50,000 and be like, do what I tell you and then give me back the mm -hmm. way. It's never going to happen. You're all, everyone's going to run away with my money. So we start really small and we have to build the relationship. And as we're building the relationship, you learn more and then you have bigger betting limits and bigger budget and bigger money to play with. So would you actually teach me? Is that is sort there of. anything involved? Sort of. You actually have to do very little. You just have to follow instructions. There's almost no thinking for you to do. Okay, I'm in, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's this, literally what it sounds like. So, yeah. So it's essentially, it's almost like, um, have you heard of those uh, sites? They're like Wall Street sharks. You know, they're like Forex currency traders. You know, they're, they're hedge fund managers. It's essentially, and they, they basically say, do what I do. You know, bet on this, right? Yeah, bet that the price of gold is going to go up. Right. I don't, That's I don't, even more I don't want a dollar. I do not accept a dollar from anybody. Right. I'm giving you the money to gamble. You oh, have to, you have to do it the way I say. Right. You do it. Yeah. You, exactly. So yeah. you're essentially, you got people working for you. <laughs> oh, more than just a few. Oh yeah. 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 How many people do you We're have? We're a global network. There's a lot of us. There's a lot of us. So this is a huge business. It's an operation. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's what you're doing now. Yeah. Now, <laughs> when I yeah. asked you, what are you doing now? And you got cheeky. This is what you're doing now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is brilliant. Yeah, is there anybody right. else doing this? Yeah. Yeah. There's there's other groups doing it. The thing is that anyone that's doing it has not the, nearly the social media presence I have. Right. So they can't even come close to reaching right. who I'm reaching. But the thing is, everyone else that's doing it is part of this one essentially larger group, right? We are mm -hmm. like one large group mm -hmm. and then we all take our client base, yeah. like whoever we have that's willing to gamble with my money, right? Or anybody's money because a lot of us that do it, yeah. right? We have the same, essentially the same information. There's like a global group of gambling sharps, right? And we all communicate. We all sell and buy information from each other. We all share information. There's so much to it, like mm -hmm. all the way down to if somebody found a casino in the Czech Republic that has one roulette wheel that the weight is off balance so the ball will always land within three numbers. It'll go into the group chat. It's not as clean as a group chat, but imagine the communication will go into a theoretical group chat. Now everybody knows that for a limited amount of time, they will always win that one roulette wheel in that one casino in the Czech Republic until they adjust the weight. But So like you guys that, are like a cartel? I wouldn't use that term. Wow. I would say we're a group. So could I get in for a thousand bucks? I, I'm just you a guy. You can't get into the network no, uh, communication. I, I, I want, with me? I want to work with you. Yeah. I don't I'm want just, any of your money. I just no, need no, no. you. I'm saying I want to bet a thousand bucks. Yeah, that's fine. But it, it's going to be my thousand dollars. It's yeah. going to be my way. So I'm a with numbers. Yeah, that's fine. I just want to play roulette. That's fine. I can literally, I can say red or black. That's fine. I can do that. But you're not going to. You're going to just bet on whatever you were instructed to bet on. Wow. Yeah, you're, I'm going to give you some the- some brain guy. I'm going to give you the link. Post it here so everyone can, okay. can do it, whatever. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the most basic information. I just want to know, um, like, name, are you over 21? What zip code do you live in? And what- level of gambling skill you have. Mm -hmm. And I only ask that for uh, sports and for table games and poker. That's okay. it. There's no detail. I don't need your social. I don't mm -hmm. need your address. Mm -hmm. I don't need your mother's maiden name. I don't really care. I just need bodies. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm going to give the bodies the money and the instruction. Mm -hmm. And then we split the profit. And if there's loss, wow. it was my money. Right. So you don't even care. Wow. How long have you been doing this for? I think we've been live for, I want to say two months, maybe two months in a week. And this is all legal. Yeah. This is all above board. Yeah, yeah, you guys yeah. are registered. Bro, I just want to clarify. I got so many lawyers, bro. I, 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 clarify I couldn't, this. I couldn't even, I couldn't even look at something illegal with someone coming down my throat. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. Yeah. How do you regulate that in terms of knowing that they're going to bet the way that you want them to bet? Okay. So at a casino, they, or any wagering company, mm -hmm. right? They offer paperwork. And when I, when it's not really me looking at it, it's the guys that work with me. When they look at it, they're real professionals. They're, they're guys that like work for the NBA. They, they work, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. When they look at it at first glance, almost immediately we can see what's happening. You can tell there's so many very obvious factors that say he just lost this session. It happens mm -hmm. versus he did whatever the heck he wanted here. Right. And there's a big difference. What actual problem we have? So the regulation is just a liability that I have, right? If they go and they do whatever they do and don't listen, it's my financial loss. Right. 
but we also cut that person, which would yeah. be stupid because if they just listened, they would be making money indefinitely. Right. Right. All they had to do was listen and they don't have to, they don't have to, the less thinking they do, the better. Mm -hmm. Let me do the thinking. Let me, let mm -hmm. me handle it. You know? Now the other problem that we actually have, which this is, this one is more problematic in theory is even after they win, they could run off with all the profit. Right. right. So let's pretend hypothetically I am, my budget with you is 10 K mm -hmm. you win 40. Now you got 50. You maybe are John Doe, a guy with no money, you know, barely paying rent, got a mm -hmm. baby on the way. Mm -hmm. You're going, I've never held 50K in my life. I go, I'm just going to run off with you, yeah. right? Now that's a realistic problem. And that's more likely what happens. There's a very, very thorough vetting process mm -hmm. to who we pick. It's not anybody and everybody. There's very specific qualifications in right. the person. Right. And it starts with the, when they click the link, there's a form. The form, believe it or not, has very pertinent information on it to me figuring out your character traits mm -hmm. as a potential gambling partner, mm -hmm. right? And I go, based on this, my team knows what to look for. We, this guy is in the right direction or for, he already clicked mm -hmm. the wrong thing. Don't even respond to him, yeah. right? If you click all the right buttons, then it goes to the next level. The next mm -hmm. level is your communication. Um, uh, what do you call it? Like, like transpondence with- Corresponding. Cor corresponding, right? Uh, with one person. And that person will vet you out a little bit. And if you pass that test, and that's a big test to pass this guy. And there's one guy in particular that's supervising the whole thing. My right hand man in life. Mm. And he's supervising it. And if that goes well, then you get on a, a call with the next up guy. And then he takes you back through a vetting process. And by the time you get through with it, we figure out, are you the guy? Mm. At the end of all of it, in theory... You can still hurt me, right? You can still run off. But Isn't you, there some kind of legal repercussion? Like, can't you put a lien yeah, on that? Isn't yeah, there some kind of, of, of course I can. But we have so many people we're working with. Like, it's a huge, huge army of yeah. people we're doing yeah. this with. That, yes, we do take legal pursuit, right? Mm -hmm. We do. Mm -hmm. But we also have to keep giving attention to the other people currently doing it and the new people. Right. So, so the, unless it's a bunch of money, it's probably not worth it. If it's, well, if it's pennies, yeah. we'll, 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 we'll pursue you legally. If you want to take us to trial, you'll probably just go broke before the trial ends and there's no money to collect. Mm -hmm. We'll probably just wring you dry on principle knowing we're not mm -hmm. going to make the money back. So like, you haven't had this problem yet? Not really. Okay. Because you have to think, bro, after week number one, you literally just saw with your own eyes how easy it was for you to make free money with no risk. Magic. Magic. That, to me, I'm incredulous. Like, I don't believe that. Yeah. No, it's fine. Until it's it fine. happens. Oh, I got you. Oh, no worries. Of course. No worries, buddy. I got you. No problem. I, fact, I still plan on signing up as soon as this podcast is over. Don't I hope get me you wrong. do. And I hope, as a matter of fact, if the timing works out so elegantly, I hope that you actually come on here without me and share your experience of doing this and include it in the pod for better or for worse. I absolutely will. Great. I'd be honored. I would be honored. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so we're yeah. going to put that link in the description. Yeah. That's what we're plugging here today. Oh, yeah. We got to it. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, and just so you know, so so the final thought on that was that once you see how literally like magic, how easy it was with your own eyes, just after the first week, you would have to be so thick skulled to run off with that when you can just keep making money. So short-sighted. Right. So, and and be, you're going to vet those kind exact, of- and Exactly. And move them out of the right. pot anyways. Exactly right. right. Exactly right. Exactly right. That's revolutionary. Yeah. Yes, sir. And uh, any whales out there, go, you got 50 mems to spend, you get 50 million, <laughs> DM them, you yeah, know? Yeah. I'll take a piece of it. Just give me a little commission. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you, if somebody comes from this pot, if somebody writes me a check for 50 million like, and they said they come from here, I'll give you a commission. Don't worry. There we go. <laughs> yeah. That's it. That's it. Mickey, yeah. what a great time I had with you. Yeah. Thanks for coming on and uh, check out the Patreon. Thank you guys. Thanks. <laughs>